Hello, word nerds. Welcome to The Dictionary, the podcast where I read the book. And my name is Spencer. Spencer. And uh, it's uh, I, t- I say the things that I think about when I read the book. All of the things that are come into my brain, I basically just say. And then I apologize if you're not into that, but I hope it's entertaining for you. Um, you can go rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts and other places. That would be great to see more of that come through. Uh, if you want to contact me in some form or follow me on social media, you can go to at DictionaryPod on Instagram and Twitter, where I sometimes post some things. And uh, there's a Facebook page as well, and there is a Google Voice number where you can call and leave a message if you want to say something for some reason. There's an email address, dictionarypod at gmail.com. If you would like to uh, make a little sound effect, because I've been doing sound effects, you can uh, you can send that audio file to me. You can also make up a little ditty, a little theme song that I would maybe play in an episode or more than one episode. Uh, you can send me that audio file either on a voicemail or more likely an email. Send it as an attachment, an audio file attachment in an email. That would be great. Um, I am recording this on December 31st, uh, 2021. It is currently 1022 a.m. Central Time. And uh, the last two episodes I recorded today as well. In order. Uh, in case you want to, you know, put these all together in some way. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Last section of page 275. Um, yeah. The first word is copayment. C-O hyphen payment. Noun from 1966. A small fixed fee that a health insurer as an HMO, requires the patient to pay for certain covered medical expenses, and examples of those would be office visits or prescription drugs. And uh, often this is just called copay, which was at the end of yesterday's episode. Uh, And yeah, you know, if you got insurance, sometimes you got to pay, you know, $20, $40, something like that for the copay, which is pretty cheap when you don't have to pay for all the other stuff. Okay, next word. Uh, what am I go- what am I gonna do for the sound effect? Fwa. It is C O P D, all caps. This is an abbreviation for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And I uh, read that a while ago. I think we probably had a little bit more extra information. But this is a uh, this is a lung disease. That is a problem, and I don't believe there is a cure for it, and uh, people have to be on oxygen. Uh, so, um, yeah, um, I yeah, it sucks. I don't know what else there is to say about that. Moving on to... It is the first form of cope, C-O-P-E, noun from the 13th century, one, a long, enveloping, Ecclesiastical vestment. Is that like a piece of clothing? I think it might be. It's not a cape. It's a cope. But it is also long and enveloping. Yeah. 2A. Something resembling a cope. As by concealing or covering. As in the example, The Dark Sky's Starry Cope. And that is a quote from P.B. Shelley. Is their name Peanut Butter Shelly? I don't think so. Number two is the synonym coping, C-O-P-I-N-G, which we will see later this episode. Uh, this is from Old English. Uh, it, so it looks like it's a suffix because it says hyphen and then C-A-P, and there's a line over the A. So it, maybe it's pronounced cop. I don't know. It's also from the lower Latin capa, which means head covering. So maybe, maybe it's a thing that you put on your head, but it's long and it goes down like a cape. I don't know. Do we have to find a picture? Possibly. Next word. It is the second form of cope, 
transitive verb from the 14th century, and it means to cover or furnish with a cope. Whatever that is. Next, foi. Third form of cope verb from the 14th century. Uh, starting with intransitive, number one is obsolete. The synonyms are strike and fight. 2A, to maintain a contest or combat, usually on even terms or with success. And this is used with the word with. Cope with, combat, okay. Good times. 2B, to deal with and attempt to overcome problems and difficulties. And this is often used with the word with again. As in, learning to cope with the demands the demands of her schedule. Oh, that's if you your schedule is so bad, you have to cope with your schedule, that's tough. You know, there are people who have bad schedules. I know nurses usually work like 12-hour shifts, sometimes more, doctors, lots and lots of hours. That is the schedule that you would have to cope with and that that's tough. Um, okay, number three is archaic. The synonyms are meet and encounter. Transitive says, number one, is obsolete, to meet in combat. I don't, I don't think I've heard of this. But the, the first one, yeah, because it's obsolete, that's why. We're, I'm going to cope? I'm going to cope you in combat? I don't know. Number two is also obsolete, to come in contact with. Yep, never heard of that. And number three is also obsolete, and the synonym is match. So is that like a combat match or matching socks? This is from Middle English, copen, or coupin, from Anglo-French, couper, which means to strike or cut, uh, from the word cop or culp, which means blow, from Lower Latin, colpus, which is an alternative of Latin, colafus, which is from Greek, colafos, which means either buffet or buffet. I think both are words, but I don't know which one this is. I don't know, man. Moving on. Fwa! It is the fourth form of cope. This one is a transitive verb from circa 1901. One, to shape, to fit a coping, or conform to the shape of another member. And the example of the thing that you are shaping is a structural member. I don't know what this is. To shape a structural member, to fit a coping, or conform to the shape of another member. I don't know what these things are. I don't know. Do you? Uh, Cope. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to see this in my life much, this word. Number two, uh, the synonym is notch, N-O-T-C-H. And you can hear my voice is starting to fade because I'm recording. This is the third episode. I, I used to record four, and I would be done by four, but now I'm done by three. Is this a problem? Maybe it is. Okay. Next word. Oh, uh, that's probably from the French word couper, which means to cut. Mm, notch, cut. Yep, that makes sense. Next word. It is copec, C-O-P-E-C-K. It is a variation of the same word with a K. Next word. It is copapad. No, copapod. Copapod. Noun from 1836, any of a large subclass, copapoda or copapoda, of usually minute freshwater and marine crustaceans. And copapod is also an adjective. So what's what's with the name, man? Uh, this is from the Greek kopi. I think that's how they would say it. That means oar or handle, like the oar of a boat, or handle. Uh, from pod or pos, which means foot, probably akin to the Latin capere, which means to take, and there's more at the words heave and foot. So 
I mean, yeah, we've seen. Uh, oh, what are they? Uh, cap, uh, ca, cap, 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 pod, cap. Oh, why am I blanking on what it is called? You know, the the squids and the octopus, and the, they're called. Um, I why can I not think of it? It's something with the C and ends with pod. It's like head pod put together. Um, so these though are copepod. The only thing that I'm seeing is the foot. And why why did they put foot in the name? They are uh, small freshwater and marine crustaceans. That's all the information I get. Maybe again we'll have to f- post a picture. Next word, foie. It is coper. Noun from 1825. This is British, and it means a horse dealer. A horse dealer, especially a dishonest one. So they're dealing in horses, selling horses, buying horses, all that stuff, but they are often very dishonest. Um, It is from the English dialect word cope, which means to trade. So they are a coper. Lots of trading. Next word. It is Copernican. Capital C-O-P-E-R-N-I-C-A-N. Adjective from 1667. Number one, of or relating to Copernicus, or the belief that the Earth rotates daily on its, on its axis and the planets revolve in orbits around the sun. Uh, who was the guy before Copernicus? Because, yeah, Copernicus was the one who said, no, no, the the planets don't revolve around the Earth. The Earth and the planets revolve around the sun. I think that's what it's saying. Uh, but there was somebody else before him who said that the Earth was the center, and they were like, well, how do we, how do we, uh, how can we figure out why, why did the planets move this way? If the Earth is in the center, they had to draw maps of the planets and how they moved, and they were very weird shapes, so it didn't really make any sense. But then, once Copernicus came around and said, no, 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 it's the sun that we go around, then everything started to make a whole lot more sense. Number two for Copernican, of radical or major importance or degree, as in, affected a Copernican revolution in philosophy. So I'm guessing that it means that, major importance, because the what Copernicus said of changing the way that the planets and stars move was a huge, major step. Huge importance. Anyway, that phrase, affected a Copernican revolution in philosophy, is a quote from the Times Literary Supplement, and I do not know what they were talking about. Something big in philosophy. Copernican is also a noun, and Copernicanism is a noun. Uh, This is from Niklaus Copernicus. Niklaus, N-I-C-O-L-A-U-S. And maybe I will quickly just put in a clip here of the They Might Be Giants song where Copernicus is mentioned. Call the men of science. Next word, fwa. Copernic. Nope. It is Coperni- Copernicium. Copernicium. Noun from 2009. 2009. A short lived, artificially produced radioactive element that has 112 protons. And it says to go see the element table. So I don't think I realized. Did they add another element in 2009? This is, um, it's from uh, Nicholas Copernicus. He got, he got an element named after him. How do you get an element named after you? You have to do something pretty amazing in science. Einstein, I think, has one. Next word. It is cope stone. One word. Noun from 1567, one, a stone forming a coping. But what what coping might we be talking about? Oh, it's the one that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, n- number two, 
a finishing touch. And the synonym is crown. A crown is a coping, a thing that sits on top. It's a finishing touch. Next word, foie, copier. I think most people, uh, if you got a printer, you probably also have a copier. Noun from 1597, one that copies. See, back in 1597, a person was a copier. Everything that was made, books and things, they all had to be copied by hand. So yeah, one that copies, specifically a machine for making copies of graphic matter as printing, drawings, or pictures. But yes, that's what it is now, but back in the day, it was not a machine. Next word, foie. It is co-pilot, noun from 1927, a qualified pilot who assists or relieves the pilot but is not in command. They don't get to say what's going on, but they do help. Next word, foie. I feel like I probably should have read that one like a co-pilot. Uh, yes, this is uh, Spencer, your co-pilot for this podcast. Uh, it, it is a, uh, a qualified pilot who assists or relieves the pilot, but is not in command. Moving on. <sighs> Coping, C-O-P-I-N-G, noun from 1601. The covering course of a wall usually with a sloping top. The covering course of a wall. It's made with a cope stone. Um, Maybe we will post a picture. I would like to see it. Would you? Next word, foie. Coping saw. I I feel like I've used this sound effect before. Maybe I have. I don't know. We're going to have to redo some. Coping saw Noun from 1925, a handsaw with a very, very narrow blade held under tension in a U-shaped frame and used especially for cutting curves in wood. Uh, Narrow blade under tension, U-shaped frame, trying to visualize it. Uh, Yeah, maybe we'll post a picture of this one too. This one's getting a lot of pictures in this episode. We haven't had any for a while. Um, Yeah, okay, moving on to our last word. It is coping stone, one word, coping stone. Noun from 1778, it is chiefly British, and the synonym is just cope stone, which is the thing that forms a coping, which is a covering course of a wall. Or it could also be just the finishing touch, like a crown. Okay, the words in this episode were copayment, C-O-P-D, cope, 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 Copec, Copepod, Coper, Copernican, Copernicium, Copestone, Copier, Copilot, Coping, Coping Saw, and Coping Stone. I think I will pick Copernican because what Copernicus did was a huge change in science. And uh, I don't know, maybe there's people who still don't believe him, but I do. And I hope you do too. Copernicus. I think all my songs are the same. I don't know. Up in the sky, you look at the planets. And you are on one of them planets. And you go around the sun. And Copernicus said you go around the sun. (laughs) All right. Uh, It's the holiday time for February 4th, 2022. Day of the Armed Struggle in Angola. In Sri Lanka. It is Independence Day. In California and Missouri in the U.S., it is Rosa Parks Day. Now, is this the day that she sat on the bus and didn't get up, or is this her birthday, and why is it only in California and Missouri? Um, It's also World Cancer Day. So, I, I don't know why they picked today, but they had to pick a day. It's National Wear Red Day. I think that could possibly be related to cancer. I don't remember, but go wear go wear some red. In Argentina, it is Lifeguard Day. Um, fun holidays: 
Bubblegum Day. Eat some bubblegum? Give Kids a Smile Day. It is, is this Liberace Day? It's spelled Liberace, but I think it's Liberace Day. National Create a Vacuum Day. Hmm, okay. National Hemp Day. Hemp can be used in lots and lots of things between food and paper and clothes and so many things. It is a very, very good, useful, uh, renewable resource that can be made. Lots of things can be made cheaply from it. I think we need to use more hemp. Uh, National Homemade Soup Day. National Quacker Day. And it shows lots of rubber duckies. Rubber ducky. National Stuffed Mushroom Day. National Thank a Mailman Day. Or just a mail carrier. Yes. If you can give them a gift at the holidays, maybe you should go do that. That would be great. Uh, Yeah, Rosa Parks Day is also known as Day of Courage. Or Day of National Day of Courage. Uh, torture Abolition Day. Oh, yeah, what a good idea. Let's get rid of torture. USO Day. Um, anything else on this page? I'm reading. Nope, that's it. We got them all again. How did we do it again? All right, I'm going to end the episode and maybe go do some stretching because my back hurts because I'm getting old. Maybe I slept on it funny. I don't know. Thank you very much for listening. I do sincerely mean that. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. This is the podcast where I am reading the dictionary and I also say the things that I think about as I am reading it. I am recording this on January 1st, 2022 at 1022 Central Time. Oh, uh, my wife is out for a walk, a long walk, and it's the weather's about to get real crappy, so she might be out during some crappy weather, but she wants to get all the walking in. She's going to go for, she's going to go for 2,022 miles this year, so we'll see if she did it. We'll see if she does it. Yesterday, she finished over 1,021 miles, uh, and that was impressive. I was there with her. Yay, we went for a walk. Got some, got some good walking in. Anyway, we, we need to talk about the words. Uh, there, This is at the top of page 276. Uh, the first word is copious, C-O-P-I-O-U-S. Adjective from the 14th century. 1A, yielding something abundantly, as in a copious harvest. Also as in copious springs. Are those like the springs where the water flows? Or is it the spring season? I think the first one makes more sense. For some reason, I am not hearing myself so great in these headphones, and I don't understand why. It might do that thing again where it all of a sudden gets louder. This is very strange to me. Okay, let's move on. Uh, 1B for copious, plentiful in number, as in copious references to other writers. So uh, maybe somebody is writing a story and they're writing many, many references to other writers, maybe people that they were inspired by. Okay, 2A, full of thought, information, or matter. Lots of, lots of things. Th- uh, 2B, profuse or exuberant in words, expression, or style, as in a copious talker. I have to be a copious talker when I am recording this podcast because if I didn't talk, you would hear nothing. But in, in normal days, I'm not uh, typically a copious talker. Unless you, unless you start talking about something I'm interested in or I know something about. Number three, present in large quantity, taking place on a large scale, as in copious weeping, like, like crying, lots and lots of crying. Uh, Also is in copious food and drink. Uh, We have seen lots and lots of sadness over the last couple of years, uh, at the very least with with COVID uh, sicknesses and deaths. And that that has presented lots of copious weeping um, and uh, obviously lots of other things. Just yesterday, uh, 
when I'm recording this, <clears throat> Betty White died just two, two and a half weeks or so before her 100th birthday. Lots of copious weeping happened yesterday, I think, all over the world. So my wife and I started watching The Golden Girls from the beginning. That was literally what we did on New Year's Eve. We watched The Golden Girls, and I think we watched 10 or so episodes from the beginning. That was a, that was a darn good show, and I think you should go watch it. We also had copious food and drinks, mostly just food. A synonym for the word copious is the word plentiful. Copiously is an adverb, and copiousness is a noun. And this is from the Latin the Latin word copia, which means abundance, from co plus ops, which means wealth. Ops, O-P-S, means wealth. And so you add a co, and it means abundance. You have lots of wealth. And there's more at the word opulent. Ah, that's where opulent comes from, just wealth. Okay, we have to do a sound effect. I just picked bong for some reason. I don't know why. Our next word is coplanar. C-O-P-L-A-N-A-R. Coplanar. Adjective from 1853. Line or acting in the same plane. P-L-A-N-E. Like a surface. Coplanarity. I think that's how you say it. Clope. Coplanarity, that is a noun. On the same plane, you are coplanar. Bong. Next word is copolymer. C O P O L Y M E R. Noun from 1936. A product of copolymerization. And copolymeric is an adjective. Now I'm wondering if maybe my headphones aren't connected. Hold on. Is that better? Eh, maybe a little bit. Hmm, maybe it could be a headphone problem. Okay, uh, bong. Next word is with the one that was in the definition, copolymerization. Copolymerization. That would be a fun one to try and figure out backwards as well. Noun from 1936. The polymerization of two substances as different monomers together. So the, the substances could be different monomers. Would you say monomers? Monomers. That's a weird word. So it's just the polymerization of two substances together. You're putting them together. And copolymerize. No. Copol- <laughs> copolymerize or copolymerize. That is a verb. You can say it either way. Bong. Next is cop out. Two words with a hyphen, noun from circa 1942. One, the act or an instance of copying out. When you cop, when you do a cop out, you are copying out. Two, an excuse or means for copying out. And the synonym is pretext. Hmm. Three, a person who cops out is a cop out. That cop out copped out while they were copying out. Next word, bong, bong, bong. It's cop out again. This one has no hyphen, but it is two words. It is an intransitive verb from 1952. One, to back out. Oh, that's the end of that one. But the example is uh, backing out of an unwanted responsibility. As in the example, cop out on jury duty. I think many people have done that. I think I I have mixed feelings. It's like on the one hand, yeah, it's my duty as a person of the citizen of the United States to be part of a jury duty. But then sometimes you're like, but I don't want to. I just don't want to. Number two, to avoid or neglect problems, responsibilities, or commitments. As in, accused the mayor of copying out on the issue. Hmm. He shouldn't have done that. Or she. Doesn't matter. The mayor shouldn't have done that. Next word. Bung. It is copper. Then a lot of these are going to be copper related uh, through the rest of this episode. This is the first form of copper. Noun from before the 12th century. One. A common reddish metallic element that is ductile and malleable 
and is one of the best conductors of heat and electricity. And it says to see the element table. Uh, so it's malleable. It can be moved around fairly easily. You look at, you know, uh, a copper wire. You can move it really easily. Ductile. What does ductile mean? I don't know exactly in this context. Um, and then, yes, it is a very good conductor of heat and electricity. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, that's why they use it in houses. So you can conduct your heat and your electricity. Number two. A coin or token made of copper or bronze. So a copper coin could be made from bronze. Uh, pennies are supposed to be made from copper, but I'm not even sure if they are anymore. Um, and I think there was a time when they definitely were not. Was it during the war or something? The war. Um, okay. Number three for copper is chiefly British. It is a large boiler... As for cooking, the kind of boiler that you use for cooking, they call it a copper. Maybe because it was made out of copper. Four, any of a subfamily of small butterflies with usually copper-colored wings. And I think we may have to post a picture of that. Um, the subfamily is Lysanini of the family Lysanidae. And it's spelled with letters l y c's other other letters um okay let's look at the etymology uh from from the latin coprum no cuprum which means copper from uh the latin let's see cyprium with a capital c cyprium uh which literally means cyprium metal so yes it's just a it's kind of metal not sure what cyprian is though uh, bong, bong. Next word, second form of copper, transitive verb from 1530, to coat or sheath with or as if with copper. So if you are coppering a thing, you are coating it in copper. That makes sense. It's logical. Bong. Third form of copper, noun from 1846, and the synonym is police officer next word bung it is copperus copperus copper with an as noun from the 14th century uh, the synonym is ferrous sulfate f-e-r-r-o-u-s and then the word sulfate uh, and then copperus uh, it is from the let's see middle latin cuperosa which is probably from aqua cuprosa, which literally means copper water. Copper water. Hmm. And ferrous, oh God, that is, um, is that copper? Is it fair? It's a f -f 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 iron? Might be, I feel like it's iron. Iron? I don't know. I don't know. But this word was copperous. Bong, bong, bong. Next word is copper beech. Beech has two E's. This is two words. Noun from 1846. A beech with shining coppery red leaves that is a widely planted cultivar of a beech native to Europe. So it's a beech, uh, a beech tree. I think that's a tree native to Europe. Um, and it's got coppery red leaves, so they just call it a copper beech. By the way, the scientific name is, I think it says, Fagus sylvatica. F-A-G-U-S, sylvatica. Next word, bung. It is copperhead. One word, noun from 1775. One. A common pit viper of the eastern and central U.S. usually having a copper-colored head and often a reddish-brown hourglass pattern on the body. Probably something you may want to stay away from. The scientific name is... Oh, boy, let's see if I can read this. There's not enough light in this room, and, and the letters are very tiny. Um, should I use the flashlight on my phone? Would that help? Let's see. It does. So the scientific name for this common pit viper is... 
and it goes over to the second line, Agkistrodon, Agkistrodon, Contor, Contortrix. Agistrodon Contortrix. That is an amazing name. Okay, number two for Copperhead is a person in the northern states who sympathized with the South during the American Civil War. Why were they called a Copperhead? Do we have a reason? There must be a reason. Something. There's some reason. So, yeah, people, somebody who lived in the North, and they were like, well, but I like the, what the South has to say, but I live in the North, so I will, I will call myself a Copperhead. I don't know if they called themselves Copperhead. That's a history part that I don't know. Bong. Next word, copper plate. One word, noun from 1663. One, an engraved or etched copper printing plate. Also, a print made from such a plate. Two, a neat script handwriting based on engraved models. So you, it's a handwriting that's in script, probably cursive, and it's very neat. It's very neat handwriting, but it is based on engraved models. Not sure exactly what that is, but uh, something. Copper plate. Maybe they engraved it on copper plates. Next word, copper pyrites. I think that's how you would say it. Two words, noun from 1757, and the synonym is just the word chalcoprite. How do you say this? I don't remember. Chalcoprite. Chalcopyrite. Chalcopyrite. Apologies. Next word, bong. Coppersmith. One word, noun from the 14th century. A worker in copper. Copper. They make... They're smithing the copper. Next word, bung. Copper sulfate. Two words, noun from 1869. A sulfate of copper, especially the normal sulfate that is white in the anhydrous, anhydrous form, but blue in the crystalline hydrous form, C-U-S-O-4-5-H-2-O, there's a dot before the five, yeah, and that is often used as an algicide and fungicide. Okay, there was a lot there. It's a, it's white in the anhydrous form, blue in the crystalline hydrous form. It's got a bunch of chemically scientific uh, element things, and it's used as an algicide and fungicide. I know fungicide gets rid of the funguses. I'm not sure alga... Oh, that must get rid of uh, algae, I think. McKill's algae, I'm guessing. Okay, next word and last word. Bung. It is the word coppery. Copper with a Y. Adjective from circa 1775. Resembling the suggesting copper. Resembling... Oh, sorry, it says or. Resembling or suggesting copper. Especially having the reddish to brownish orange color of copper. It is so coppery. So the words in this episode were copious, coplanar, copolymer, copolymerization, cop out, cop out, copper, copperus, copper beach, copperhead, copper plate, copper pyrites, copper smith, copper sulfate, and coppery. Hmm... What do I want to pick? Uh, let's see. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll pick copious. I think that's a good word. I'll pick copious as the word of the episode. This song has lots of words and... Oh, though no, that's a bad idea. Don't do not do that. Uh, this song uh, is the copious song. It says the word copious a lot. I like to say copious, 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 and see it's the copious song. Copious, copious. You say copious copiously and there's so much so much copiousness in this song it's early i'm tired uh okay so it's time to read the holidays uh in mexico it is constitution day in denmark it is crown princess mary's birthday in pakistan it is Kashmir solidarity day in san marino it is liberation day in Finland, it is Runeberg's birthday. 
in Burundi. It is Unity Day. Um, it is National Weather Person's Day. Uh, let's see. I think we read those in Peru. It is Pisco Sour Day, which is a Peruvian liquor. In India, it is Vasant Panchami. In Mexico, it is Constitution Day of Mexico. What do the fun holidays have to say? It is California Western Monarch Day. That is the butterfly. Probably not the uh, the copper butterfly that I read here, although the, the wings are on the orange side. Not quite coppery. It is Disaster Day. Huh. That's no fun. Ice Cream for Breakfast Day. I love it. International Clash Day. Is that the band, The Clash? I feel like I've read these before, but maybe not. Um, Move Hollywood and Broadway to Lebanon, Pennsylvania Day. This is fascinating. So somebody in Lebanon, Pennsylvania said, I'm going to make a day where we try to move Hollywood and Broadway. Can you imagine moving both Hollywood and Broadway to a town in Pennsylvania or just anywhere together? Interesting. National Chocolate Fondue Day. National Fart Day. And it shows a picture of beans. Go f- let, our, let out your farts all over the place. Uh, okay, National Shower with a Friend Day. You may not want to sh- fart in that shower, though. Don't f- it, When you fart in the shower, it smells very bad very quickly, and it has to do with the moisture in the air. I, don't, I can't be the only one who knows this or who has done this. Uh, yeah, go shower with a friend if you want. Uh, you, I, yeah, no judgment. Take your child to the library day. I think it should be done much more often. World Nutella Day. That is a tasty, tasty treat. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Uh, no. I think that's it. There's a lot of lot of food things today. Well, there's a few food things today. All right. That is a good place to end this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to go figure out why I can't hear myself in the headphones. This has been Spencer Dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. It is my podcast. I am Spencer. You are here to listen to me read the book and give you my comments about the things that I say sometimes. Sometimes I just read a thing and that's it and no comments come out. Uh, I get I get weird. I get singy. I make sound effects. I read the holidays at the end for about another month and then maybe I'll do something else. I don't know. I'm just glad that you are here, and I hope that you are letting people know that you can hear the dictionary read out loud by some dude. Um, In yesterday's episode, I couldn't hear myself very well. Um, I don't know. I think it was maybe the connection on the thing, so I moved the cable to a different thing, and it it seems a bit better. I think it's a bit better. Okay, you needed to know these things. I am still recording this on January 1st. Now it is 1046, and let us record another episode, and that may be all I record today. Okay, the first word in this episode is coppice. C-O-P-P-I-C-E, first form, noun from 1534. One, a thicket, grove, or growth of small trees is a coppice. Two, forest originating mainly from shoots or root suckers rather than seed. Shoots or root suckers. That would be an interesting band name in some way. Spencer and the root suckers. What are root suckers and what are shoots? I mean, I know shoots, but do they not come from seeds? Interesting. Okay. This is a Middle English word, or from the Middle English word, spelled C-O-P-I-E-S, and that is a cut-over area overgrown with brush. Um, it's from the vulgar Latin uh, colpare, which means to cut, um, from lower Latin colpus, which means blow, and there's more at the word cope. Okay, next word, quee! That's my sound effect for today. It is the second form of coppice verb from 1538. To cut back, 
so as to regrow in the form of a coppice. And I assume, oh, that was transitive, by the way. Uh, so I guess it's, uh, you're cutting it back so it regrows in the form of a thicket grove or growth of small trees. Maybe that one or the number two one. I'm not sure which one. But it all has to do with uh, uh, lots of um, uh, growing things, things that grow, uh, but they have been cut. That's the main thing that I'm figuring out from this. Uh, And then intransitive says to form a coppice. Uh, But specifically, if we're talking about a tree, it is to sprout freely from the base. Okay, well, that is where trees grow from. But does this mean that if you cut down a tree and the stump is still there, then another tree will grow from that trump? We've seen that. Trump? Why did I say trump? Stump. Uh, so maybe another tree. I see I combined stump and tree. That's where that happened. Um, so would a... If, it happens all the time. A tree grows from a dead tree. Uh, so would that be a coppice? Or is that act coppicing? I need a scientific... I need a smart person to tell me these things. Let's move on to... Quee! It is the prefix C-O-P-R or C-O-P-R-O. Um, and this means, oh, dung or feces. Uh, as in coprolite. And we are going to see uh, a bunch of words that use this prefix in this episode. Lots and lots of words that I am not familiar with in this episode. Uh, so yes, the prefix Copper, copper or copro means dung or feces. So this is going to be a very fun episode. This is from Greek, copper or copro with a K, from kopros, which is akin to the Sanskrit sock. I don't know how to pronounce it. S A K R T. I have a sneeze. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so the Sanskrit word is S-A-K-R-T, and that means dung. But I want to know how to pronounce it. Sakert? I don't know. Okay, let's get into it. What's next? It's not one of those words. It's It's not a poop. It's not a poop word. It is the word... I have to do my sound effect. Quee! It is copra, or copra, C O P R A. It is a noun from 1584. Dried coconut meat yielding coconut oil. This is a Portuguese word, copra, from a Malayalam word, copara. So yeah, Malayalam, I think that that's a language, and their word, uh, K-O-P-P-A-R-A, copara. Uh, it probably just means coconut meat, yielding coconut oil. Okay, next word, qui. It is coprocessor, noun from 1980, an extra processor in a computer that is designed to perform specialized tasks as mathematical calculations. So yeah, if you got more than one processor, you got coprocessors. I think I need another processor in my brain. Moving on to qui, coproduct, product with co, noun from 1942, and the synonym is the number one definition for the word byproduct, B-Y hyphen product. Uh, yeah, by, so that's it. it's probably a thing that uh, the byproduct, when you create a thing and then there's something else that comes along with it or is left over, that's kind of byproduct. Okay, go to the end of the bees if you want to hear me read it appropriately. Quee! This next word is coprolalia. C O P R O L A L I A. Coprolalia. Noun from 1886. This is f- oh, fun. Obsessive or uncontrollable use of obscene language. You swear a lot and you cannot control all the swears coming out of your mouth. And you are obsessively doing it. Is this 
an actual condition that people can have? I mean, I know that uh, when people have Tourette's, there are often a lot of swears that come out, and that is uncontrollable. I don't know if it's obsessive, um, but maybe this is something else. I don't know. Or maybe just people who are constantly swearing all the time, obscene language. There's a lot of words that can be part of that. Uh, you can say, you got the coprolalia. I don't know. I mean, I swear a fair amount when I'm not reading this book to you and not uh, at work, uh, but not not to the extent of this. This is a great word. Quee! Next word is coprolite. Copro, C-O-P-R-O-L-I-T-E. Noun from 1829. It is fossilized excrement. And this is uh, definitely using that C-O-P-R-O prefix. Fossilized excrement. Coprolytic is an adjective. So yeah, you can find fossils of bones and eggs and things, but yes, there I guess they've also found fossilized poop from probably dinosaurs. Do we need to post a picture of fossilized excrement on social media? I, th- I think we probably need to. We need to normalize this stuff. Um, I don't know. I thought I had something else to say about fossilized excrement. I don't. It's called coprolite. If you see C-O-P-R or C-O-P-R-O before something, there's a 50-50 chance it has to do with poop. What about this word? Quee! Uh, how do you say this one? Coprophagus. Coprophagus. C-O-P-R-O-P-H-A-G-O-U-S. Coprophagus. Adjective from 1826. This is feeding on dung. Something that eats dung is coprophagus. Uh, And coprophagy, coprophagy is a noun. Um, What, what does this? What is there? Are there creatures that do this regularly? Probably. Maybe, maybe fungi. Fungi probably does that. I don't think dung beetles actually eat dung. I think they just roll it into a ball. But why do they do that? There must be a reason. Um, the, the etymology isn't terribly helpful. We know the first part. Yeah. Okay, next word. Quee! This is going to be interesting. Let's find out what it says. It is the word coprophilia. C-O-P-R-O-P-H-I-L-I-A. Noun from 1923. I feel like I need to read it first before I say it out loud. Um, yeah, this is a uh, this is more of an adult uh, adult themed word. So deal with that how you want to deal with that. If you want to pause, skip ahead, fine. If not, fine. It's a word in the English language. It is marked interest in excrement. I guess you could say marked. So uh, you have a lot of interest in the poop from things. But especially, it is the use of feces or filth for sexual excitement. And there's no judgment here. Sometimes people are interested in those things. People people are interested in lots of different things when it comes to sex, and that's just the way they are. The, the When it becomes a problem is when it's going to hurt somebody else. We're going to say this forever. That is That is a problem. But if it's not hurting anybody else, and it's for your own excitement, and it makes you happy, then it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's fine. But to some of us, it might seem kind of weird. I wouldn't do this. But that's me. You might like it. That's fine. We're no, we're not going to talk about this anymore, um, other than the fact that we're going to say that coprophiliac is a noun. Okay, next word. Um, again, related to poop. This is the big poop section. Until we get to the word poop. <laughs> uh, quee! It is copra coprophilus. Coprophilus. It's an adjective from circa 1900, growing or living on dung. Uh, as in, the example, the example, the example, coprophilus fungi. And yes, fungi. 
Fungi, they're just going to eat whatever. They, they, they don't scavenge, but they just feed on organic matter. And so, uh, yes, they are, uh, where did it go? They grow on dung. They live on dung. They are probably uh, coprophagous. They eat it, and uh, it makes them grow strong. Um, yep, there's probably other things too, but I think fungi is definitely the biggest, the biggest uh, example of something that grows or lives on dung. Um, what, are there certain kind of fungi that grow out of dung, and what do they look like? You got to go watch that movie, Fantastic Fungi. Mm, it's great. Next word, qui. It is cops. C O P S E. I'm sorry, we are done with all of the poop words. Uh, this is a noun from 1578, and it is the number one definition for the word coppice, which is a thicket, grove, or growth of small trees. Okay, next word, qui. It is copped. Capital C O P T. Noun from circa 1520. One, a member of of the traditional Monophysite Christian church originating and centering in Egypt. Number two, a member of a people descended from the ancient Egyptians. And this is from, let's see, the Arabic word kubt, Q-U-B-T, which means cops, C-O-P-T-S, which is from... Uh, the Coptic word, uh, interesting, so there's a language I think called Coptic, their word is Kiptios, or Giptios, which means Egyptian, from the Greek word Egyptios, I don't know how to pronounce these, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's all about Egypt. Next word, qui, it is Copter, C-O-P-T-E-R, it's a noun from 1943. The synonym is just helicopter. But maybe when you call it a copter, it's a helicopter from Egypt. Qui! Next word, Coptic, with a capital C. First form, noun from, uh, no, 1668. It is an Afro-Asiatic language descended from ancient Egyptian. Surprised? No. Ancient Egyptian and used as the liturgical language of the Coptic Church. Uh, Afro-Asiatic language that came from ancient Egyptian. Um, it must still be... Oh, yes. So that is the word, that is the language that was mentioned in the word Copt. Their word, Coptos, uh, Coptic language means... Oh, boy. Let's start over. The Coptic word, Kiptios, means Egyptian. Okay, is it all coming together for you now? Good. Qui, second form of the word Coptic. It's probably going to be related to Egypt again. Adjective from 1677, of or relating to the Copts, their liturgical language, or their church. Yep, anything about those things is Coptic. Okay, now we're done with the Egyptians. Moving on to something else. Qui! It is the word copula, C O P U L A, noun from 1619, something that connects, as A, the connecting link between subject and predicate of a proposition, and B, the synonym is linking verb. So you need a word in your sentence to link all the stuff together so it makes sense. And it's called a copula. Qui! Next word. And uh, let's see. This one and the next one are going to be, again, sexually related. So it is the word copulate. I don't think I said it. Copulate. It is an intransitive verb from 1630 to engage in sexual intercourse. Uh, so yeah, a couple of people or more are doing the sexual intercourse they are copulating. Uh, it is copulation, that is a noun, and copulatory is an adjective. Uh, the Latin, it is from the Latin copulatus, 
Uh, oh, that is from the verb capulare, which means to join. Uh, also from their word, cop- I don't know how to say it, copula, copula, copula. Um, that, uh, yeah, so you look at you look at our last word, copula. Um, it's all about connecting and joining. By the way, I forgot to mention the etymology for that one. Um, it's the it's it means bond. Copula means bond, and there's more of the word couple. So yes, joining, joining things together, uh, bonding. It all makes sense. You're bonding sentences together. You are bonding, joining human bodies or not human. You know, animals are copulating as well. Um, all the things are coming together. Um, if we want to take this another step further. If there is poop related poop involved in this uh, copulation, it would be coprof- coprophilic copulation. I don't know. I just wanted to combine words that sound sort of similar. Okay. Um, moving on to quee. It is the word copulative. First form. Uh, oh, it's our last word. We got two forms here. C O P U L A T I V E. You could also say copulative, adjective from the 14th century. 1A, joining together coordinate word, coordinate words or word groups and expressing addition of their meaning. Meanings, plural, as in a copulative conjunction. 1B, functioning as a copula. And that's just a... Uh, a connecting link between subject and predicate of a proposition, or it's a linking verb. Number two, relating to or serving for copulation. It's all about joining things together. And our very last word, second form of copulative or copulative. It is a noun from 1530. It is just a copulative word. So it could also, that word could also just be called a copula, probably. Okay, so the words in this episode were coppice, copper or copro, uh, copra, coprocessor, coproduct, coprolalia, coprolite, coprophagus, co- no, it's coprophagus, coprophilia, coprophilus. Finding the emphasis is so hard. Cops, copt, copter, coptic, copula, copulate, and copulative, or copulative. Um, Well, I just think this one is fun. Uh, Copralalia, that is obsessive or uncontrollable use of obscene language. I just think it's funny. That's all, and it's just a good word. Copralalia, copralalia, you swear a lot, you can't control it, it's not something to be made fun of. But it is the word coprolalia. Um, yep. This this sometimes is where the podcast goes. You get you get weird you get words like this, words about obscene language and poop and sex, and sometimes you just have to talk about it. But it's just like all the other stuff. You talk. It's let's look ahead. Let's find something else. Cordless. We're gonna talk about things that don't have cords. That is literally what this podcast is about, reading everything in the English language and talking about it. Okay, we're also going to talk about holidays. In the UN, it is International Day of Zero Tolerance to Female Genital Mutilation. If we have said this before, it's worth saying again. This is a thing that should not be happening all over the world. In California, it is Ronald Reagan Day. In Russia, Finland, Norway, and Sweden, it's Sami National Day. In New Zealand, it is Waitangi Day, which is the founding of New Zealand in 1840. Uh, Okay, let's check this page. I think we read those. Fun holidays. Dump your significant jerk day. Now, does that mean that if your significant other is a jerk, then you should dump them? Or do you have somebody who is a significant jerk in your life? If you do, you should get rid of them. It is lame duck day. 
I'm not sure how you're supposed to celebrate that. Uh, National Frozen Yogurt Day. Pay a Compliment Day. Super Bowl Sunday. I guess the Super Bowl is being played today. Super Chicken Wing Day, probably related to Super Bowl. Yeah, these are all sounding very familiar to me. It's Bob Marley's birthday. Go listen to some reggae music, specifically Bob Marley's mu- Bob Marley's music. So good. Redemption song, good stuff. British Yorkshire Pudding Day. Time to talk day. It is time to talk. We need to talk about this. What are we going to talk about? I don't know. We'll find out what we're going to talk about in tomorrow's episode when we get there. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. This is my podcast where I read the book and I tell you what I think about it. Uh, Okay, so the first word in this episode is... um, I am recording this on January 3rd, 2020 at 5.12 p.m. Central Standard Time. Okay, the first word is copy, C-O-P-Y. It is the first form, noun, from the 14th century. One, an imitation, transcript, or reproduction of an original work as a letter, a painting, a table, or a dress. Those are examples of the original work, but those are the, you know, they're not the only examples, but it would be funny if they were the only possible examples. A letter, a painting, a table, and a dress. Just those things. Number two, one of a series of especially mechanical reproductions of an original impression. Also, an individual example of such a reproduction. Three, is archaic, something to be imitated, and the synonym is model. Uh, something to be imitated, model. What, like a like a like a model for a painting, and that would be the copy. I don't know, but it's archaic. For a matter to be set, especially for printing, matter to be set, especially for printing. Would that be the uh, the text, the letters? I don't know. For B, something considered printable or newsworthy, and this is used without an article, as in remarks that make good copy. That is a quote from Norman Cousins. Yeah, copy, uh, this next one is similar for C, text especially of an advertisement. When, when you hear people talking about the copy, it's the text, it's the writing, could be, uh, you know, it could be a script, it could be an ad, could be uh, an article. It's the copy is the text. Number five, it is the number one A definition for the word duplicate. And I think it would be duplicate in this situation and not duplicate. Uh, as in, a duplicate of a computer file. Also as in, a duplicate of a gene. I recently just saw a video on the internet that I think may have been computer generated, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure it was, of a cell duplicating itself, a cell copying, uh, separating. Uh, and, and it was the most detailed version of this I've ever seen, which is why I kind of think it was computer generated. Um, but I mean, you know, with technology, it could be real. Uh, but it was really interesting. Because there were all these little little things in, inside. I don't know if they were the, the genes or they were something. They looked like little cylinders, little, uh, little somethings. And they were all in the center. And then as it separates, half of them go to one cell and half of them go to the other cell. And they move, the, like the, the gravity, the, the physics of it moved very realistically. Although I don't know in the real world if that's how they move at such a small scale. Um... It was just a super fascinating thing. And then you think about, how does this thing duplicate itself? How does it know what to do? And then, you know, as it separates, there's like a piece in the middle that doesn't totally get separated. And that sort of hung out there for a little bit. And, you know, eventually that does fully get separated. But it was just a really fascinating thing to to see, the copying of a, of a cell, a gene, whatever it is. 
Okay, lastly, it is a synonym. Uh, another synonym for this word copy is the word reproduction. Uh, the etymology says, uh, hmm, Middle Latin, copia, uh, which is also regular Latin. It means abundance, and there's more at the word copious. If you have so many things, they're just copies on copies on copies. It's a copious amount, I guess. All right, I got to do a sound effect. I'm, I'm running out of ideas of sound effects to make, so I'm just going to go, uh, fia! I think I did something like that recently. Um, okay, second form of copy is a verb from the 14th century, starting with transitive. One, to make a copy or duplicate of, as in copy a document. Also as in copy a computer file. I use copy on a computer all the time. Copy, paste, copy, paste. I also use undo a lot. Number two, the model oneself on. No, to model oneself on. If you're copying somebody else, you are modeling yourself on them, them on you, them, we on each other. Okay, now we have intransitive. Number one, to make a copy. Two, to undergo copying. As in, the map did not copy well. Uh, oftentimes when you make a copy, if it's an analog thing, a cassette tape, a VHS tape, uh, every time it gets copied, it loses some quality. Uh, and that's, that's not good. Um, I've been watching some old VHS tapes. They're not necessarily copies, but they have been played a lot, and the quality is not very good. Okay, synonym information for this second form of copy. It's a pretty good amount. Copy, imitate, mimic, ape, and mock mean to make something so that it resembles an existing thing. Copy suggests duplicating an original as nearly as possible, as in copied the painting and sold the fake as an original. It's not a nice thing to do but impressive if you can do it. Imitate suggests following a model or a pattern, but may allow for some variation, as in, imitate a poet's style. Mimic implies a close copying as a voice or mannerism, often for fun, ridicule, or lifelike imitation, as in, pupils mimicking their teacher. Uh, I don't know why, but just for some reason throughout my life, I, this is a thing that I have done. I just sometimes can't help it. And it's not meant to be uh, in a ridicule in any way. It's just a, it's just fun to copy, to mimic somebody. Uh, the way they say it, the way, the way they say things. Uh, okay, ape may suggest presumptuous, presumptuous, slavish, or inept imitating of a superior original. Ape... A-P-E, may suggest presumptuous, slavish, or inept imitating of a superior original, as in American fashion designers aped their European colleagues. So that must mean their European colleagues are the superior original. Mock usually implies imitation with derision, as in mocking a vain man's pompous manner. Mocking a vain man's pompous manner. He's so vain, he doesn't even... He thinks this song is about him. I screwed screwed that up so bad. Okay, next word. Fia! Copybook. One word, noun from 1588. A book formerly used in teaching penmanship and containing models for imitation. So they, this book would show you the quote-unquote proper way to write things, uh, and then it, you know you would you would copy from it. There would probably be sections where you could write. Uh, so it's a, it's a copy book, but you gotta find your own handwriting. Fia. Next word: copy boy. One word: noun from 1888. One who carries copy and runs errands as in a newspaper office. Uh, they probably, I assume, would make copies as well, but they also carry copies, so they take copies from one place to another. Uh, 
And they also run errands. Next word is the first form of copycat. One word, noun from 1896. One, one who imitates or adopts the behavior or practices of another. I don't know, it doesn't say why the word cat is in here. So some, so for some reason, it just became copycat. Not copy dog, not copy hamster, not copy bird. Uh, maybe they used cat because of the k sound, copy cat. It was fun. There's alliteration. Number two, an imitative act or product, as in copycat board games. Next word is the second form of copycat, verb from 1926, starting with intransitive, to act as a copycat. And the transitive is just the synonym imitate. Next word is copy desk. One word, noun from 1921, the desk at which newspaper copy is edited. So this is not a copy being made. This is not an imitation. This is not a, uh, uh, an exact copy of the text. This is the text. It is not written. It's edited. It's edited here at the copy desk. It's the desk for the copy. The text copy. You get it? Okay, good. Fia. Next word is copy editor. Two words. Noun from 1899. One. An editor who prepares copy for the typesetter. So if we replace the word copy with text, the editor prepares the text for the typesetter, and the typesetter is the one who puts all the letters on the thing so then it can be printed up. And this I don't think really happens anymore. Number two, one who edits and headlines newspaper copy. Just newspaper text. Uh, copy edit is a transitive verb. So the copy editor copy edits. Next word, fraw. It is copy hold. One word, noun from the 15th century. One, a former tenure of land in England and Ireland by right of being recorded in the court of the manor. Copy hold. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know why it's called copy hold. They have a hold on it, I guess. Uh, former tenure of land in England and Ireland by right of being recorded in the court of the manor. Uh, manor is M-A-N-O-R, by the way. Number two, an estate held by copy hold. The copy hold is held by copy hold. Here we go with next word. Yeah. Copy holder. They are probably the ones who hold the copy hold. Noun from 1847, one, one who reads copy for a proofreader. Okay, this is not at all what I thought. One who reads copy for a proofreader. Uh, so there's the proofreader, and then there's somebody else who reads the copy to the proofreader, and they are the copy holder. They hold the copy so they can read it out loud so the proofreader can proofread. I guess. Number two for copy holder, a device for holding copy, especially for a typesetter. So both the typesetter and the proofreader need a copy holder, but sometimes I think it's the person and sometimes it's a thing. Interesting. Depends on the context. Next word, fia, copyist, noun from 1696, one, one who makes copies. And two, the synonym is imitator. Next word, fjaw. Copy reader. Noun from 1892. I would think it would be one who reads copy. Uh, the synonym is the word copy editor. Copy read is a transitive verb. Next word, um, almost our last word, fia. It's the first form of the word Copyright, C-O-P-Y-R-I-G-H-T. It is a noun from 1735. 
the exclusive legal right to reproduce, publish, sell, or distribute the matter and form of something as a literary, musical, or artistic work. Fia, second form of copyright, transitive verb from circa 1806, to secure a copyright on. And copyrightable is an adjective. Fia, third form of copyright, is an adjective from 1870, secured by copyright. And our last word is copywriter. This one is spelled C-O-P-Y-W-R-I-T-E-R. The one who writes copy, probably. Noun from 1911, a writer of advertising or publicity copy. Okay, so in this episode, the words were copy, copy book, copy boy, copy cat, copy desk, copy editor, Copy holder, no, copy hold, copy holder, copyist, copy reader, copyright, and copy writer. Uh, Let's see, what shall I do? Um, I will pick, uh, hmm, I will pick copycat as the word of the episode. Um, I don't know why. It's, um, It's fun to be a copycat, and uh, it's a fun, there's some fun alliteration, Copycat, copycat, go, go, copycat, don't be a copycat. I don't know where I'm going with this song. Oh, boy. It's a, it's a fine time to record a podcast. Okay, let's just read the holidays instead. It is Independence Day in Granada, which is from the UK in 1974. It is National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day in the U.S. Uh, so, obviously, so that is specifically recognizing HIV and AIDS in the black community. Um, I, why it's only in the U.S., I'm not sure. I'm sure there it's it exists in other places. Um, in Australia and Canada, it is Rose Day. In Mexico, it is Constitution Day of Mexico. Let's check this fun holiday page. Ballet Day. Go watch some ballet and uh, try to do some ballet moves. National Fettuccine Alfredo Day. National Football Hangover Day. And it says it's observed the day after the Super Bowl. I assume the Super Bowl is happening. I was just seeing some people talking about football. So I think it's happening. Uh, let's see. National Periodic Table Day. National Poop Day. It's also the day after the Super Bowl. (laughs) Oh, boy. Uh, I hate to be a janitor at various places after the Super Bowl. Um, National Poop Day. Man, I should have had a fart for the sound effect. It is Send a Card to a Friend Day. Wave all your fingers at your neighbor's day. So you can send a card to them... And you can also wave your fingers. <laughs> wave all of your fingers? <laughs> uh, it's very odd. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Uh, National Sicky Day. I wonder if that's because people call in sick after the Super Bowl. It is E Day. E, the letter E, the lowercase E. This is a math thing, uh, so I have to read a little bit about it. Uh, let's see. <laughs> it is... The letter E in math is an inexplicably recurring number in the world of mathematics. It has a never-ending chain of decimal points, the beginning of which is 2.718281828, and so on. Uh, This holiday is celebrated on 2-7 for the obvious reason that the date holds the same digits as E rounded to the nearest tenth. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's an important, uh, letter number in math, and I really should know more about it, but I do not, so I will have to learn about E. And, uh, let's see, it's National Marriage Week, so everybody should go get married this week. It's also Tinnitus Awareness Week, that's when you got some trouble with your hearing. And, uh, did I get them all? I think I did. Thought I saw something else. Yep, I think that is it. Okay. This has been a blast. Thank you for 
putting up with all of this, especially the terrible, terrible songs and the sound effects. Uh, until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. I am your host, Spencer, and I shall be reading this book to you and telling you what I think about it as I read it. Uh, I have various comments and jokes and songs and sound effects and, and holidays at the end, at least for now. Uh, okay, um, if you would be so kind, uh, I sure would love a, a, a review. You could write a review. Five stars would be amazing. Uh, you, can, you could do it on various platforms. Uh, Apple Podcast is the big one, but I think Spotify has a rating system. Um, if you don't want to do that, go ahead and subscribe to the show anyway. Share this podcast with the people you know. Share it with the people you don't know. You can uh, tag me on those posts, or you can talk to me on uh, Twitter and Instagram. My handle is at DictionaryPod. I think you know how to spell dictionary. Uh, You can email me, DictionaryPod at gmail.com, if you want to talk about whatever. If you want to leave me a voicemail, you can call the Google Voice number that is in the show notes. And what else you can do? You can do lots of things, and I've said that before. Um... I think that's fine. I'm looking for a little uh, little song. If you want to write a little ditty, send a little song, a five or ten second song that I can put at the beginning of the uh, of the uh, show. And uh, if you want to make your own little sound effect, which I'm doing that for now, uh, you can send me one of those too. All right, let's read this last section of page 276. The first word is... Uh, this is the, uh, let's see, We half of this episode is the short C-O-Q section. Not a lot of C-O-Q words. Uh, and then, then we've got C-O-R, and there's a lot of those. Okay, so the first word is uh, technically three words. It is pronounced Kokovan or Kakovan. Uh, let's see, and the emphasis, I think, is always on the last syllable and you don't really say the N sound. It's sort of a subtle. Kokovan. It is spelled C-O-Q, next word, A-U, next word, V-I-N. Noun from circa 1938. This is chicken cooked in usually red wine. And uh, so this is a French phrase, if you couldn't tell. And it means, this is a word for chicken. It means cock with wine. You know, the cock, the rooster, chicken, the hen, that's that's where it co- all comes from. Um, so yes, C-O-Q, it's very obvious when you look at the words. Um, so that's, that's that one, chicken in red wine. Uh, okay, my sound effect is going to be a weird one today. I'm going to do a little bit of this thing. Can't tell if you can hear that, but it happened. You probably heard the, the cheek slap more than the, the tone that I was supposed to be making. Okay, the next word is, I think it is pronounced coquette. There's three form, oh, yes, here we go. We, we, so they moved the pronunciation for this first form um, into different sections because there's a different pronunciation for the number one definition and the number two definition. Uh, so, let's see. It, it is a noun from 1691. The number one definition pronunciation is either coquette or co- uh, coquet. Coquet would be the other way. It is spelled C-O-Q-U-E-T. And number one is a man who indulges in coquetry. Uh, yes, coquetry. That is how it's pronounced. And we will see that soon. Number two, this one is definitely pronounced coquette. And the synonym is coquette spelled with an extra T-E at the end. That is the extra French way to spell it. We will also see that one shortly. Um, And yeah, this is uh, just the French word uh, diminutive of C-O-Q. Coq, which we learned, means cock. Uh, But this one, this one, I don't think so much means chicken. We will get into it later. Okay, next word. It is Again, coquette, spelled the same way, second form, adjective from 1697, and it is a characteristic of a coquette. That one is spelled with the E-T-T-E. 
Um, and then the synonym coquettish. C O Q U E T T I S H. So characteristic of a coquette is either coquettish or just coquette, spelled differently. Confusing? It's very confusing if you're only hearing me describe it. You need to see this. It helps. Okay, next word. It is coquette again, third form. This one is spelled either the way that I spelled the other one, or you can also add that T-E at the end. This is a verb, um, an intransitive verb from 1701. Number one, to play the coquette. And the synonym is flirt. And again, we will be getting to the official coquette word shortly, so it'll make a little bit more sense. But yeah, to play the coquette, also just flirt, is to coquette. Number two, to deal with something playfully rather than seriously. And the synonym for everything is the word trifle. To deal with something playfully rather than seriously. So does that mean that there's a serious topic and you choose to deal with it in a playful manner and so you are coquetting? You have coquetted? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think that makes sense. Uh, really, anytime you deal with something in a playful way opposed to uh, dealing with it seriously, I guess you'd be coquetting. Okay, next word. It is coquetry. Coquetry. You could also pronounce it coquetry. Emphasize that second syllable. Um, And then we just added the R-Y at the end of coquette. This is a noun from circa 1656, and this is a flirtatious act or attitude. So we saw this word, co- 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 uh, how do I want to say it? Coquetry. Uh, we saw that in the number one definition for coquette or coquet. Uh, that was a man who indulges in coquetry. So a man who indulges uh, in a flirtatious, flirtatious act or attitude. That is what coquetry is. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that's why I was thinking, um, you know, when you look at the etymology for coquette, it just said cock, uh, the, the French word for cock. And so that's why it's not so much of a chicken in this case, like the first word. We've gone into a new realm. Uh, okay, next word. It is coquette. <laughs> Do you see any repetition here? Uh, this is the one that is spelled with an E-T-T-E at the end. It is a noun from circa 1611. A woman who endeavors without sincere affection to gain the attention and admiration of men. So this, you know, clearly this is the more feminine word, the female word compared, you know, coquette, coquette, for some reason, we've added an E-T-T-E at the end of words when we want to make them feminine. And of course, these are incredibly... Uh, old words and terms that I don't think we really need to be using anymore. Um, But uh, let let me just reread that again because I wasn't totally paying attention. A woman who endeavors without sincere affection to gain the attention and admiration of men. Mm, Yeah, this, you know, this, you can can, um, bundle this word with a number of other words that people you like to use to talk about women, and I don't think the women like to use those words. At least, they don't like to be called those words. So, uh, you know, that's what I'm gathering this word means. Um, but then, if you look at the male version of this, it's, um, where did it go? A man who indulges in coquetry, a flirtatious act or attitude. So, you know, they're, they're similar definitions, but the, the female one, the woman one, has a lot more information and I feel like a lot more um what's the word I'm looking for um connotion there, there's more meaning behind the words in the uh the coquette ette version I don't know if anybody else has seen that but that's what I'm seeing we can't get away from these genderized things they're so ingrained in our language our society our culture so so that's that uh Coquettish is an adjective, coquettishly is an adverb, and coquettishness is a noun. 
And uh, yeah, it just says it's French. It's the feminine of coquette, spelled the other way. Okay, moving on. We're still in the COQs, but we're not talking about flirting or chicken. Next word is coquie. And I think, yes, co- actually, uh, you can pronounce it, I think, either coquie or coquie. Coquie. It is spelled C-O-Q-U-I, noun from circa 1903. It is a small, chiefly nocturnal, arboreal frog native to Puerto Rico that has a high-pitched call and has been introduced into Hawaii and southern Florida. And the scientific name is, ooh, this is going to be fun, Eleutherodactylus coqui. I think I did it. Uh, it is from the American Spanish word coqui with the accent on the I, and uh, which probably just means frog or this kind of frog. Uh, let's see. It's mostly nocturnal, so it's awake at night. It's uh, arboreal, so it's probably in the trees. Uh, I have heard these frogs in person. I don't, I don't know if I ever saw any. I think I may have. I don't believe I have any pictures, but maybe if I'm motivated, I will go look. Uh, but yes, there are these very small frogs. Uh, I was in uh, Puerto Rico for work a number of years ago, and that you know that's the big thing, the, the coqui frogs. And I'm going to try to do this right now. In fact, if I had thought about this ahead of time, I would have made this my sound effect. I'm going to try to make the sound of, from what I remember of this coqui frog, and I think I will have it close. I don't know if I'll be able to whistle quite high enough, but I think if I'm remembering correctly, I was able to whistle it pretty good when I was there. Let me see. Let me, let me warm up. Please, please let me warm up. Okay. It's something like that. Uh, maybe I'll put in some real audio of a coqui frog, uh, so you can hear the difference, but you know, that's basically what they sound like. So at nighttime, if you're walking around, you hear that all over the place. It's, it's pretty amazing. Okay, next word. I'm not going to do the the frog sound effect. I'm just going to keep on doing what I was doing. It is coquina. So it's like coqui, but we added an N-A. This is a noun from 1837. One, a soft whitish limestone formed of broken shells and corals cemented together and used for building. I feel like I've seen this, but uh, it's it's an interesting it's it's an interesting way to build a building. Broken shells, like do you actually see the corals and the shells in the stuff in the walls? I feel like you do. I don't know, but it's a uh, yeah, coquina, or no, it's just coquina. And then number two, a small wedge-shaped clam used for broth or chowder and occurring in the intertidal zone of sandy Atlantic beaches from Delaware to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, So that must be clearly where they got the name of the cement from these clams and other things. They just said, we're going to name it after this clam that we killed and put in our walls. Uh, By the way, the scientific name for this clam is Donax variabilis. This is a Spanish word, probably a diminutive of the word coca, which means head, uh, alternative of coco, which means boogeyman or coconut. And I do feel like I remember when I got to coconut, I remember reading boogeyman. Why? Why boogeyman? Uh, yeah, maybe, and maybe we'll post a picture of this clam. It's probably going to look like all the other clams. All right, next word. It is the first of the C-O-R words, and it is just C-O-R, core. First form, you can also spell it with a K. Noun from the 14th century, an ancient Hebrew and Phoenician unit of measure of capacity. Uh, And it just says it's, uh, well, from lower Latin, chorus, from the Hebrew core with a K, with a line over the O. But capacity can mean different things. Is this weight? Is this volume? What is this measure of capacity? 
you're not giving me enough information here. And then I got to go look it up on my own. Uh, I don't know. Okay, next word. Second form of core, abbreviation for one, corner, two, coroner. There's a different there. We put an O in the middle, corner, coroner. Two, no, three, corpus, or four, corresponding. I think I'm getting worse. The next word is core again. This one has a capital C, and it is an abbreviation for Corinthians. Next word. I switched hands that time, and maybe I hit myself harder. I don't know. It sounded better. Okay, next word is coracle or caracle. C-O-R-A-C-L-E. Noun from circa 1547. A small boat used in Britain from ancient times and made of a frame, as of wicker, covered usually with hide or tarpaulin. Tarpaulin. Tarpaulin? Tarpaulin. Uh, and I think it's interesting that it's made from wicker. And at first, when I read that, I thought, well, a boat made from wicker is not going to float. That boat ain't going to float because it's made of wicker. Uh, but then it said it was covered in something. So there you go. That that helps. This word, coracle, is from the Welsh word spelled C-O-R-W-G-L which I assume is pronounced similar to coracle, but not how my brain would work. Welsh is one of the more interesting languages in the world. Corwgugl? Um, Yeah, a small boat. I wonder, like, how is it different from today's boats? Uh, maybe I shall find a picture. Next word. It is coracold or caracold. C O R A. And then the word cold. Now, uh, no, 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 no. Adjective from 1741. Of relating to or being a process of the scapula in most mammals or a well-developed cartilage bone of many lower vertebrates that extends from the scapula to or toward the sternum. And coracoid is a noun. So... It's the process of the scalp and most... The word process there is kind of throwing me off. Um, but it's a bone or cartilage bone between... I guess it's sort of around the area of the scapula, which is your, your shoulder blades, and your sternum, which is, you know, the front of your chest, basically. Um, hmm, I'm, I'm not familiar with this bone or, or uh, something related to this bone. The etymology says it is from the Greek korakoides, which literally means like a raven. Ooh. Uh, which is from korax, which means raven. And there's more at the word raven. Um, so we must be getting close to uh, the prefix kor something that's raven related. I feel like, uh, I don't know, maybe we will, maybe we won't. But anyway, that's a that's a cool a cool bone a cool etymology I like it, and then coracoid is also a noun, the bone and something related to that bone. Next word, it is coral, C O R A L, noun from the 14th century, one uh, one a, the calcareous or horny skeletal deposit produced by anthozoan or rarely hydrozoan polyps. So usually produced by anthozoan, or sometimes produced, rarely produced by hydrozoan polyps. Especially, a richly red precious coral secreted by a gorgonian. By a gorgonian? Uh, and the genus name of a gorgonian is corellium. What is a gorgonian? Is it a fish? And that it somehow creates, mm, I, I'm, I'm sort of aware of this, but I am not coming up with it in my brain. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to look more into the Gorgonian and how they create coral. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, these are 
well, we could talk more about that at the end, but coral is super important, and all over the world, big chunks of it are dying because of climate change. Yay! So, we and we need the coral because it creates helps to create the habitat for other plants and animals in the water, and if those die out, then our water is going to get all messed up. It's a whole cycle. We need to save lots of things to save all the other things, including ourselves. Okay, 1B for coral. A polyp or polyp colony together with its membranes and skeleton. If you ever come across coral, if you ever come across coral, um, don't touch it. Don't take any pieces of it. Just leave it. Leave it there. Number two, a piece of coral and especially of red coral. 3A, a bright reddish ovary as of a lobster or scallop. Um, hmm, I wonder why that's called coral. Uh, well, partly probably because it's reddish and it's in the water. 3B, a deep pink. I am very curious to know, though, is the deep pink color that we think of as coral, is it similar to the red of the coral? Because so much of this is saying that it's mostly red, usually red. Uh, so that that's that's interesting. Why wouldn't we make the that red color called coral instead? But uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they do look the same. But you between the word red and pink, you gotta you gotta think those are not gonna look the same. Coral is also an adjective, and coralloid is also an adjective, something related to a coral. And the etymology is not terribly interesting. Next word. It is coral bells. Coral bells. One word. Noun from circa 1900. It is, uh, let's see. I think, oh, here we go. A perennial alum root, A-L-U-M, alum root, widely cultivated for its feathery spikes of tiny, usually reddish bell-shaped flowers. And the scientific name of this perennial alum root is Huchera sanguinea. So, why is it called coral bells? There is no etymology. I'm guessing that maybe it's partly because of the reddishness. Um, feathery spikes, though. I want to see those. We, we might need to post a picture of that one. Hmm. Okay, next word. It is coral berry. Coral berry, one word. Noun from circa 1859. A North American dwarf shrub that bears clusters of small flowers succeeded by red or white berries. The scientific name of this North American dwarf shrub is Symphoricarpos orbiculatus. Orbiculatus. I think I said that right. Uh, it's a shrub. It's got flowers and berries, like most shrubs, I feel like. Okay, next and last word. It is coralline or caroline. And of course, the first thing that I thought of was that movie and book and character. Uh, but this one has one less L. It is C-O-R-A-L-L-I-N-E. And if you are ever confused about that movie, Coraline, I mean, they make a whole big point about saying her name in the movie. Um, it's Coraline and not Caroline. But you can think of, you know, coral in the water. Coral. It's also a name. Coral. But this one's Coraline. Uh, okay. It is a noun from... 1543, one, a coralline red alga, and I assume that's how you pronounce that word, alga. It's, uh, you know, it's a red alga, uh, that's the plant that, um, and then it's in the water, and it's coralline probably because it's red, and maybe it's near coral. Number two, a bryozoan or hydroid that resembles a coral. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think I have spoken uh, way too much in this episode, so let's quickly finish this up. First, okay, the words were coquette, coquetry, coquette, 
Kokui, Kokina, Kor, Kor, Coracle, Coracoid, Coral, Coral Bells, Coral Berry, and Coraline. And man, there were a couple that I uh, wanted to pick. Uh, but 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 then I found other good ones. Let's see. I'm quickly reading. There was one that I think I may. Where was it? Where was it? Where was it? Uh, here we go. Okay. So I am going to pick the verb form of coquette, but specifically the second definition, which says to deal with something playfully rather than seriously. And sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's great to coquette where you don't take anything play f- no you don't take anything seriously and you only take it playfully um all right so what what do i have to do next i need to read the holidays for this february 8th which uh you probably are not listening to this on in um some mahayana buddhism traditions it is parin uh, Parinirvana, ah, Parinirvana with a P A R I at the beginning. Parinirvana Day. What is that? Is that like partial nirvana? In Slovenia, it is Pereseren Day. It's Propose Day. Who's celebrating Propose Day? Uh, let's see. I think that is good there. Fun holidays. It is Boy Scouts Day. I never did. Never did nothing with the Boy Scouts. Uh, that was not a path that I took. I think it would have. I think I would have learned some very useful uh, things, like starting a fire. And you know, not that I didn't learn a few of them later, but I think I would have learned some good skills. Um, it is Extraterrestrial Culture Day, Laugh and Get Rich Day. If I could get paid to laugh, that would be the best job ever. Can we make that happen? It is National Kite Flying Day, National Molasses Bar Day, Opera Day. Yeah, Propose Day. It uh, shows a picture of somebody proposing. Uh, let's see. Anything else? And safer Internet Day. Uh, safer in so many ways. I think that would be great. Uh, let's see. Safer to get less people being hacked. Safer where... It's uh, people aren't getting, especially kids, aren't getting bullied. How can you make, how can you do that other than changing the people's minds? I'm not sure. But yes, let's make a safer internet. All right, that is enough. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary, which is the podcast that you have on right now. And it's also the one where I read the dictionary and tell you what I think about it. Uh, Okay, so uh, we are at the top of page 277, the first word. Hopefully I won't have as much to say about all the words in this episode like I did yesterday, uh, which I just recorded. Should I tell you, it's January 5th, 5.02 p.m., 2022 Central. Uh, Okay, the first word is, again, Coraline, C-O-R-A-L-L-I-N-E, Adjective from circa 1633. One of relating to or resembling coral. Uh, the, the last, the first form was a noun. That was in the uh, yesterday's episode. Uh, that's the noun version of a thing, a couple of things. Uh, but this one is the, uh, this is the adjective. So something resembling a coral. Two of relating to or being any of a family of calcareous red algae or algae, depending on how you want to say that word. I never know. I just go back and forth. Uh, the scientific name, no, the family of this uh, algae is Corallinaceae, something like that. Uh, this is French, feminine of Corallin, which means coral-like. That's good. Okay, next word. I'm surprised I didn't think of this sound effect earlier. Although maybe I did. I don't think I did. I'm just gonna do a little like a little like a little cat little cap purr. Alright, next word is coral snake. Two words, noun from circa seventeen seventy two. One, any of several venomous, chiefly tropical New World elapid snakes, 
brilliantly banded in red, black, and yellow or white that include two ranging northward into the southern U.S. Uh, the genus name of these alapid snakes is uh, Micrurus. Is that M-I-C-R-U-R-U-S? Micrurus. Micrurus? Um, the two that it is talking about, those two that are ranging from northward into the southern U.S., uh, Micrurus fulvius and Micrurus, I think that's it, Micrurus Uraxanthus. I think I got it all. Um, it's venomous. Stay away from it. It is banded in red, black, and yellow, or white. So uh, red, black, and yellow, or red, black, and white. S- try and stay away from that. Maybe I should post a picture you can see, because it's good to know what it looks like. Number two, any of several harmless snakes resembling the coral snakes. So things that aren't even called coral snakes get called coral snakes. Uh, Why are they called coral snakes? It doesn't say. Is it the red? Do they live near in coral? Uh, It is tropical, a lapid. I don't know what a lapid means. Uh, Maybe that means that they live in the water too? Huh, not sure. I, I assume most of you don't know what a lapid means either. Okay, next word. It is Coranto, Coranto, noun from 1564. The synonym is, uh, how do you say this, Corante, or is it just Courant? It is spelled C-O-U-R-A-N-T-E, Courant, I'm going to guess. I don't know what that is. We're not going to know for a while, so we don't know what Coranto is. Next word, Corbin. Corbin, C-O-R-B-A-N, noun from the 14th century, a sacrifice or offering to God among the ancient Hebrews. So the Hebrews got together and decided to give an offering or a sacrifice to God, which is called Korban. Corbin? Corbin. Korban. Korban. Maybe it's Korban. Noun... That's, I already said that. Uh, this is Hebrew, korban, which means offering. Next word, corbel or cor, corbet. Corbel or corbet, spelled either C-O-R-B-E-I-L-L, or you can add an E after the L's. Uh, actually, it's a double L, so you can add an L-E after the L. It's a noun from circa 1734, a sculptured basket of flowers or fruit as an architectural decoration. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure we've seen these. It's a a sculpted basket. Are those like the the ones in cement that people put in front of their houses? And you put flowers or fruit, and you can call it a corbel or a corbet. Uh, This is French, literally means basket Okay, I didn't know those things had words. I just would have called it a cement vase, (laughs) right? What else would we call it? Okay, next word. That was was an intense purr. Uh, It is corbel, again, but it is spelled C-O-R-B-E-L, first form, noun from the 15th century, an architectural member that projects from within a wall and supports a weight, especially one that is stepped upward and outward from a vertical surface. And it shows a picture of a corbel. Uh Uh-huh, hmm. So I think it's just a big thing that comes out around a couple of windows. It's made of bricks. And there's a ledge above. I don't know how you can get to the ledge. And there's a ledge below. So what is the purpose of this architectural member that projects from within a wall and supports what what weight does it support or does the building is the building supported on it maybe that's what it's for i feel like there must be a reason for it um we also have an especialise one that is stepped upward and outward from a vertical surface i don't believe i read that but maybe i did 
I think I did. So yeah, it's a brick brick ornamental thing that's coming out from the windows and it supports weight. Oh, it is from, aha, uh, Middle French diminutive of cor, C-O-R-P, which is a raven. And yesterday we had coracoid, which was like a raven. Um, yeah, more at the Latin corv, corvus, corvus, which means uh, there's more of the word raven. So maybe the ravens sit on top of the corbel. Which came first, though? Next word. Corbel, again. Yeah, second form. Verb, transitive verb from 1843. To furnish with or make into a corbel. So you have to corbel the corbel. Otherwise, how is it going to corbel? Next word. Corbeline. Noun from 1548. One. Corbel work. Uh, so the, the work that made, went into making the corbel uh, is the corbeline. Yeah. One. Uh, no, two. The construction of a corbel. Wow, you can just make a whole sentence where you just only use that one word. Okay, next word. That was a very happy cat. It is corbic corbicula. Corbicula. C O R B I C U L A. Noun from 1816. The synonym is pollen basket. Oh, good. A pollen, no, a basket of pollen. That is exactly what I want. Right in my face. Uh, it is from the Latin corbis, which means basket. A pollen basket? What is a pollen basket? We'll find out later. Next word. Corby. C-O-R-B-I-E. Noun from the 15th century. It is chiefly Scottish. Yes, it does seem like a pretty Scottish word. The synonym is carrion crow, and then also the synonym raven. So we're getting closer to why these words are related to ravens. But they all start with C-O-R. This is from, hey, look at that, uh, the Latin corvinus, which means of a raven. And there's more at the word, here we go, corvine. I knew it in my brain somewhere, but I could not think of what it was. Uh, corvine is all about the ravens and probably the crows too. Those I think are also corvins, corvines. They also, yeah. Next word, corbina, C-O-R-B-I-N-A, noun from 1901, a coastal marine croaker favored by surf casters along the California coast. I do not know what any of this means. A croaker? Is that a fish? Is that a frog? What is a croaker? I have never heard of a croaker. Um, and it's favored by surf casters. Are these people who... Is it, Wait, what is a surf caster? Is that a fish? Is uh, Are those just... Is that another term for people who like to go sur a surfboarder? A surf caster? What's a surf caster? I, I got no information from this one. Uh, the scientific name for this croaker is a um, Mentisiris undulatus. I think that is close. Uh, yeah, this is from Spanish corvina, uh, which, which they probably say corbina, which is why we say corbina. Um, it is a marine fish. Uh, the scientific name for the marine fish is Argigrosomus regius, uh, feminine of Corvino, Corbino, which is of a raven. So does the fish look like a raven? Why is raven connected to this? Uh, so yes, the croaker must be a fish. Next word. Cord. First form. Noun from the 14th century. 1A. A long, slender, flexible material, usually consisting of several strands, as of thread or yarn, woven or twisted together. 1B, the hangman's rope. They call it the cord. 2, a moral, spiritual, or emotional bond. 3A, an anatomical structure, as a nerve or tendon, 
resembling a cord, like the spine, or especially it says the synonym umbilical cord, the 1A definition for that. Uh, ba -do -ba -do, yep, we all had one of them. Isn't that the thing? What's that joke or the riddle or whatever? How can you tell who Adam and Eve are? Because Eve doesn't, like if you go up to heaven, whatever the phrase is, she doesn't have a belly button. Neither one of them would have a belly button, actually, now that I think about it. So, there you go. Cord. Um, 3B. A small, flexible, insulated electrical cable having a plug at one or both ends used to connect a lamp or other appliance with a receptacle. A receptacle? 4. A unit of wood cut for fuel equal to a stack 4 by 4 by 8 feet or 128 cubic feet. So 128 cubic feet is 4 by 4 by 8. 4 by 4 by 8. Okay, 5A. A rib like, a rib like a cord on a textile. So fabric, and it's got a it's got a thing, like a probably a, a cord sewn into the textile. So that's a cord. But they call it a rib. 5B1. A fabric made with such ribs or a garment made of such a fabric. Oh, like corduroy. It's made with a bunch of cords. 5B2 is plural. Trousers made of such a fabric. Yo, where, where are your cords? I feel like I had a pair of corduroy overalls when I was little. I think that's my only experience wearing corduroy. Okay, this is from Latin corda, which means string, from Greek cordy, and there's more at the word yarn. Next word. Second form of cord, transitive verb from the 15th century. One, to furnish, bind, or connect with a cord. Two, to pile up in cords. And the example of what you would be piling is wood, you know, just logs of wood. You may make a cord, and it's called a cord. You wrap it with a cord. Corder is a noun. Next word. Cordage. Noun from 1582. One. Ropes or cords. Ropes or cords. Just that. Especially the ropes in the rigging of a ship. Two. The number of cords as of wood on a given area. So, how many cords big is that area? And those would be the, the wrapped up wood. Do people measure land that way? Maybe they do. Next word. Uh, last word, chordate. C-O-R-D-A-T-E. Adjective from 1769. Shaped like a heart, as in a chordate leaf. And then it says to see the leaf illustration. So there must be enough chordate leaves to require that they get noted in the illustration. And they look like a heart. Chordately is an adverb. And the, yep, yep, that is it. That's it. Okay, the words in this episode were coraline, coral snake, coranto, corban, corbel, 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 corbeline, Corbicula, Corby, Corbina, Cord, Cordage, cor and Cord Date. Oh my god, so many words. Uh, well, I'm not going to pick the pollen basket. Mm, let's see, we got that. There were so many different things. Oh, Corb, lots of, lot of raven stuff. Mmm. Scalp the Boy, maybe, maybe I will just pick a, what would the Corby? That's a fun one. That's the one that's, um, it's a raven. It's a crow. It's chiefly Scottish. Corby. The Corbys are flying. The Corbys are flying. That's the end of that song. All right. The holidays for today. Um, Public Day in Lebanon is St. Maroon's Day. Uh, we can skip those things. Oh, hey. It's National Pizza Day. Ho, hey, it's National Pizza Day. Go get some pizza. Put on some pepperoni. But make it vegan pepperoni. 
that is cel being celebrated in Canada and the UK and the US. Fun holidays? Oh, it's chocolate day. Didn't we have already like two chocolate days this year? And I think that's uh, three chocolate days too few. We need more. Oh, interesting. It is National Cut the Cord Day. <laughs> we just had all those cord words. And cord date. Uh, we really need to cut the cord. We have a bunch of streaming things. We pay too much for cable. Maybe, maybe I can do it on February 9th. That would be amazing. National Develop Alternative Vices Day. So maybe your vice, you don't like it so much. So go get a new one. Somebody once said to me, everybody has a vice. What's your vice? And I don't think I had one. Uh, National Toothache Day. Read in the bathtub day. Take a bath. Read a book. Don't fall asleep. That's it. Those are all the words for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And now I'm going to go eat dinner. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. This is the podcast where I, Spencer, read the, some words and definitions and etymologies and synonyms and, uh, and then I tell you what I think about them, sort of, sometimes. Okay, the first word in this episode is corded, C-O-R-D-E-D, -D, adjective from the 14th century, 1A, made of or provided with cords or ridges. Specifically, muscled in ridges. Muscled in ridges. What is muscled in ridges? 1B is talking about a muscle. Thank you. The synonyms are tense and taut. So if your muscles are very tense or taut, they're corded. Number two, bound, fastened, or wound about with cords. Three, striped or ribbed with or as if with cord. Uh, the synonym for that is twilled, as in corded fabric. Four, equipped with an electrical cord, as in a corded phone. And all of the kids are saying, phones had cords? Okay, uh, next word, uh, sound effect is... Bloop, bloop. It is the word cord grass. One word, noun from 1857, any of a genus of chiefly salt marsh grasses of coastal regions of Europe, northern Africa, and the New World that have stiff culms and panicled spikelets. Stiff culms, C-U-L-M-S, and panicled spikelets. And the genus name is Spartina, or Spartina. I don't know how they want me to say that. Bloop, bloop. Next word is cordial, spelled cordial. First form, adjective from the 14th century. Number one is obsolete, of or relating to the heart. And the synonym is vital. So they used to word, the, they used to, they used to use the word cordial for things relating to the heart. Um, we'll look at the etymology to see why. Two, tending to revive, cheer, or invigorate, as in bottles full of excellent cordial waters, excellent cordial waters. That is a quote from Daniel Defoe. 3a, sincerely or deeply felt, as in a cordial dislike for each other. A cordial dislike. Well, uh, that is um, sincerely or deeply felt. Okay. And 3B, warmly and genially affable, as in cordial relations. A synonym for everything is the word gracious. Cordially, cordially, or cordially, that is an adverb, and cordialness is a noun. And the etymology says this is from the Latin word cor, or the prefix cord, which means heart. And there's more at the word heart. So that's why uh, that first one was of or relating to the heart. Um, and then I guess if you look at the other ones, three and four, 
uh, sincerely or deeply felt, warmly, congenially affable. Uh, oh, there was no four, just three A and three B. Um, th- that it's all sort of sort of related to the heart, you know, feeling things deeply, emotions. Even though the heart has technically, literally nothing to do with those, we we sort of say it does. Bloop, bloop. Second form of cordial noun from the 14th century. One, a stimulating medicine or drink. And number two, the synonym is liqueur. Uh, a stimulating medicine or drink. So I guess you could call energy drinks, Red Bull, other things. You could call those cordials if you really wanted to, because technically it would be correct. Bloop, bloop. Next word is cordiality or cordiality, cordiality, something like that. Uh, cordiality, noun from 1611, sincere affection and kindness, cordial regard. Sincere affection and kindness. It's so, it's so good to be, have cordiality. Bloop. Next word is cordia pulmonalia, two words, cordia pulmonalia. This is the plural of cor pulmonal, pul, pulmonal, pulmonale. Um, that is essentially the synonym for this one. We won't see that one for at least a few episodes. Um, why they had to put the plural version of a thing as its own, uh, as its own entry is a little bit weird. Usually for, for nouns, they'll actually say what the plural is in the actual place for that word, but why they had to separate it, I'm not entirely sure why. Bloop, bloop. Next word is cor- cordiorite, cordiorite, C-O-R-D-I-E-R-I-T-E, noun from circa 1814, a blue mineral of vitreous luster and strong dichroism that consists of a silicate of aluminum, iron, and magnesium. And this is from French, Pierre L. A. Cordier. I don't know how to say his last name in proper French. Cordier? Uh, He died, I assume he was a he. He died in 1861 and was a French geologist. Yeah, usually when you see that suffix I-T-E at the end, it means something related to minerals or stones or, you know, that sort of world, that geology world. Uh, Cordierite. So does that mean that his name was pronounced Cordier? Could have, could be, could be. Bloop, bloop. Next word is Cordiform. Cordiform. There's an I after the D. Adjective from 1828. Shaped like a heart. As in, a cordiform sea urchin shell. Uh, and yeah, I mean, we saw before that uh, core or cord means heart. So that's where this comes from. Uh, more specifically, this one, though, comes from uh, the, the French cordiform with an E. Bloop, 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 bloop. Next word is cordillera. Cordillera or cordillera or cordillera. C-O-R-D-I-L-L-E-R-A. I think the best pronunciation is probably Cordillera. It is a noun from 1704. A system of mountain ranges often consisting of a number of more or less parallel chains. Hmm. So uh, lots of mountain ranges running parallel to each other. Cordillerin. Cordillerin is an adjective. So you would call a cordillera cordillerin, but can other things be cordillerin? I would assume even like uh, things that are not mountain ranges. Maybe if they look like mountains and they're running parallel to each other, maybe those can be cordillerin. Bloop, 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 bloop. Next word is cordite. Cordite, noun from 1889. A, see, I wonder, I was wondering if this is back in that mineral geology world, but I don't know if it is. A smokeless powder 
composed of nitroglycerin, gun cotton, and a petroleum substance usually gelatinized by addition of acetone and pressed into cords resembling brown twine. What? A smokeless powder that is made into cords that look like brown twine. So, uh, yeah. Oh, I, this must be the stuff that they use to... Uh, yeah, I think I've seen this probably in movies. I don't know where else I would have seen it. They, uh, You can just sort of pour pour the, the this essentially gunpowder, uh, flammable powder. You can pour it in a line and then light it. Uh, that must be what this is. I will have to see if I can... Uh, Maybe find a picture or something. But uh, it's cordite, so it's still sort of not minerals necessarily, but it is this thing that is uh, made from substances. I don't know what the ite suffix actually means. We will learn about that when we get to I. Next word is cordless. Adjective from 1906. The opposite of the first word in this episode. Having no cord, especially powered by a battery, as in a cordless telephone. Cordless is also a noun. That cordless is cordless. Yeah, we, when I was a kid, that was the first time, mm, probably, I mean, it says uh, 1906, so I was not a kid back then. But when I was a kid, cordless phones, that was when they got they got real, real big. Bloop, 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 bloop. Next word is Cordoba. Cordoba or Cordova. You have to emphasize the first syllable because uh, it is spelled C-O-R-D-O-B-A and the, uh, the first O has an accent. It looks like it's down on the left and up on the right. Cordoba. Noun from 1913, it just says to see the money table. So it's money. Why is it called a Cordoba? It is a Spanish word. It is from Francisco Fernandez de Cordoba, who was a Spanish explorer and died in 1526. So important, they made, they named money after Francisco. Francisco! Next word is cordon or cordon, C-O-R-D-O-N, first form, noun from the 15th century, 1A, an ornamental cord or ribbon, 1B, the synonym is string course, string course, 2A, a line of troops or of military posts enclosing an area to prevent passage. To be a line of persons or objects around a person or place. A line of persons or objects around a person or place, as in a cordon of police, of police. I don't know why I said it that way. Um, also, yeah, so if you got if your place is surrounded by police, then that's not good. Um, I also think if there's a place that's really popular, maybe it's a food place, people want to stand in line for something. If there's a whole big long line around the block. It would be called a cordon or cordon. Three. And what is this word? It goes over to the second line. Second line, espalier. It must not be nearly as complicated as I think it is. And espalier, especially of a fruit tree, trained as a single horizontal shoot or two diverging horizontal shoots in a single line. Something about fruit trees. Fruit trees. Uh, yeah, that is good for that. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Next is the second form of cordon or cordon. It is a transitive verb from 1561. To form a protective or restrictive cordon around. And this is usually used with the word off. As in, police cordoned off the area around the crime scene. We've we've all heard this, I think, cordon off that area. I don't know if I ever fully realized what they were saying, uh, but it's a uh, you know make a line of police. It look that looks like a cord. Police go make a cord. 
Um, yeah, because this is uh, f- the first form of cordon says it is French. It is a diminutive of cord with an E, which means cord. So it's just making a cord, a line. Next word. It is cordon sanitaire. Sanitaire. Two words. Cordon sanitaire. I think that is how to say it. So uh, the first word is the same. Cordon, cordon, cordon. And the second word is S-A-N-I-T-A-I-R-E. Sanitaire. This is a noun from 1920. A protective barrier, as of buffer states, against a potentially aggressive nation or a dangerous influence, as an ideology. So it's a protective barrier against a potentially aggressive nation or a dangerous influence. Uh, This is French, and it literally means sanitary cordon. Uh, And that's that's, uh, cordon. That's how they want to say it, I think. And uh, it just, then it says, in parentheses, quarantine line. So sanitary cordon is basically a quarantine line, and so that's what that is. And that's basically what the police are making when you cordon off an area. It's a protective barrier against a potentially aggressive nation or a dangerous influence. Depends on which side of the uh, that, that cordon line is we're talking about. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Next word is... Cordovan. Cordovan. I think that's how it is pronounced. Cordovan. This is our last word. We've got two forms. C-O-R-D-O-V-A-N. Adjective from 1591. Number one is capitalized. Of or relating to Cordoba and especially Cordoba, Spain. So maybe they use the money Cordoba in Cordoba, Spain. That would be very meta. How do you know if you're talking about the town or the money? Uh, Number two, made of Cordovan leather. This is Old Spanish Cordovano from Cordova, uh, Cordova, Spain, which is now uh, Cordoba. So they changed the V to a B. Um, So uh, so then uh, Cordovan is something related to the town, but maybe if we look at the uh, the etymology for the Cordoba money, it's named for somebody uh, named Cordoba. So maybe he was from the town, but I don't know. 1591 is when this was uh, made. He died in 1526, so I don't know. I, it's all related somehow, I'm sure of it. I am positive. Bloop, 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 bloop. Next and last word is Cordovan, or Cordovan again, uh, the second form, noun from circa 1625. One, a soft, fine-grained colored leather. And two, dense, non-porous leather tanned from the inner layer of horsehide. I shall keep my opinions to myself, maybe. Okay, so the words today were corded, cord grass, Cordial, cordiality, cordia pulmonalia, cordiorite, cordiform, cordillera, or cordillera, cordite, cordless, cordoba, cordon, cordon sanitaire, and cordovan. Well, there were some good ones in here. Some good, I had some good education today. Uh, I think I shall pick the one of the only words that I actually knew which is uh, cordiality, although I don't think I would have been able to tell you specifically that it means sincere affection and kindness. Cordiality, C-O-R-D-I-A-L-I-T-Y. I think we need more cordiality in the world. Cordiality. Um, yeah. That's good. Uh, briefly, just because it's uh, been something I've been, it's been on my brain. Um, I've mentioned that I'm helping to produce a film called Unplugged, and um, while we have recorded the vast majority of the voiceover because it will be an animated film, uh, not 
all of the big name people have been added to IMDb. Um, but over the last week or two, um, we've actually been getting people uh, officially added, which is really, really exciting for us and huge. So when you go to the IMDb page for Unplugged, um, you will see, finally, Christina Ricci, Ed Asner, Jerry Ryan, Louis Gossett Jr., Dana Ashbrook, John Doe, Jonathan Joss, and other extremely important people, but there's a bunch of them, so I won't go through all their names. Uh, we're still missing a couple, but um, just this morning when I'm recording this, Ed Asner was added officially, officially to the IMDb page. So that is uh, huge for us. And, um, you know, I I need to go learn more about his work. I will fully admit that I am extremely uneducated on his work, uh, so I need to fix that. Um, let's talk about the holidays. All right. In Malta, it is Feast of St. Paul's Shipwreck. In Eritrea, it is Fenkel Day. F-E-N-K-I-L. That sounds interesting. What is it? In Iraqi Kurdistan, it is Kurdish Authors Union Day. In Italy, it is National Memorial Day of the Exiles and Foib. I don't know what that last word is. F-O-I-B-E. This page says it is World Pulses Day, so go check your pulse. Have somebody else check your pulse, maybe, if uh, if it's if it doesn't sound right. Maybe get it fixed. Maybe you've got a thing that you need to get worked on. But most most people, it's probably good. But it's it's a good idea to go get it checked, because you never know what's going on. In India, it is Teddy Day. Don't know what kind of teddy we're talking about there. Probably teddy bears. It is, uh, this is more fun holidays, Giving Hearts Day. So I uh, chose a picture of a heart drawn on paper, so maybe give a heart. And, you know, you, you can, um, where where were we? Uh, cordial, of or relating to the heart. So do something cord- cordially. It is International Cribbage Day. That is the game Cribbage. I played it when I was a kid, and I think I played it maybe two times, and then that was it. National Cream Cheese Brownie Day. I don't believe I have ever had a cream cheese brownie, but that sounds amazing. National Flannel Day. Go wear some flannel, especially if you're in the northern hemisphere where it's colder. It'll warm you up. National Home Warranty Day. Primsol Day. And it it's a kind of boat, I guess. Yes, Teddy Day. I don't know why the one page said it was being celebrated in India. I think it's being celebrated other places day. It's teddy bears. It's also umbrella day. Go put an umbrella on your teddy bear so they don't get wet. And uh, I think this last page just says umbrella day. That's it. Thank you very much to all of you for listening to this. Was that proper English? I'm not so sure. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary. I am Spencer. It is my podcast that is where the dictionary is read, and then I tell you about it. The first word in this episode is corduroy. 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 C-O-R-D-U-R-O-Y. Corduroy. Uh, First form Noun from circa 1791, 1A, uh, this would be plural, trousers of corduroy fabric. Corduroys. And uh, yeah, where did we, let's see, two episodes ago we said cord, uh, and I think corduroy was mentioned in there somewhere. 1B, a durable, usually cotton pile fabric with vertical ribs or whales, W-A-L-E-S. Number two, logs laid aside, no, logs laid side by side transversely to make a road surface. What kind of logs are we talking about? That they're put on a, a, they're on a road? Hmm, corduroy, I am very confused by that one. The etymology is unknown for this word, but I think it is pretty obvious that the, it comes from the word cord because, you know, we talked about the corduroy pants and it's made their cords going down the pants, down the fabric, whatever it is. 
and uh, and then logs laid side by sa- side. Uh, those are probably cords of logs. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, the sound effect for today will be um second form of corduroy. This is a transitive verb from 1854. To build of what? To build of logs laid side by side transversely. Uh, so corduroying the corduroy. But then also to build a corduroy road across. What is a corduroy road? And that is hard to say. It should be a corduroy road. Uh, the example the thing of the thing that you're building uh, from that first part is a road. To build a road. Oh, I I don't know why I read this wrong. To build a thing of logs laid side by side transversely. Okay. But yeah, now I'm really curious about a corduroy road. Um. Next word is cordwain. It's one word. Cord plus W-A-I-N. Cordwain. Noun from the 14th century. It is archaic and it is, uh, it's just cordovan leather. And I want to say cordovan leather, but, um, you know, if we look back at yesterday's episode, it's, uh, the emphasis is on the first syllable. Cordovan leather is also just cordwain. The etymology for this says, uh, you know, it's pretty similar to the cordovan leather that we had yesterday. So we can skip that. Om. Next word is cordwainer. Same word, what we added in ER, cordwainer. Noun from the 14th century. Number one is archaic. A worker in cordovan leather. And number two, the synonym is just shoemaker. So, uh, you know, probably a lot of shoes were made from this type of leather. Cord wainery. Cord wainery. That is a noun. The cord wainer practices cord wainer with cord wainer leather. Om. Next word is cord wood. One word. Noun from circa 1639. Wood piled or sold in cords. Um, next word is going to take up half of this episode. It is the first form of the word core, C-O-R-E. Noun from the 14th century. Uh, it really just says it's Middle English. There's no etymology, so it gives us even more space for definitions. And there is a bunch of them. Okay, one, a central and often foundational part of usually distinct from the enveloping part of a difference in nature, as in the core of the city. That was an interesting definition. Uh, it's being enveloped a difference. The nature is around the city, but then there's the city that's protecting the core of the city. I don't know. We have um, more sub-definitions for 1A. The usually inedible central part of some fruits as a pineapple. Yeah, the core of a pineapple is not exactly a consistency that you want to be eating, especially the papery or leathery carpels composing the ripened ovary in a palm fruit as an apple. The papery or leathery carpels composing the ripened ovary. Are they talking about the, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably where the seeds are. There's that there's that part, the core of the apple. Uh, it, it has a different consistency. Yeah, it's like hardened. It's kind of a weird thing. Uh, but there are some people, some people I know, who eat that whole thing, and I don't care for that. I, I, I leave the core for the, for the compost. 1B, the portion of a foundry mold that shapes the interior of a hollow casting. 1C, A vertical space in a multi-story building. A vertical space in a multi-story building. And the example of what is going on in this vertical space, it could be for elevator shafts, stairways, or plumbing apparatus. Yes, if you are going to make a building, you got to make sure you got space for the things like that. And then usually they put it in the core, in the center, uh, because it's then they only need to make one of those so people everybody can use it. 
and then the apartments can can spread around. Same with uh, bathrooms and pipes. Uh, okay, we are now on 1D1, a mass of iron serving to concentrate and intensify the magnetic field resulting from a current in a surrounding coil. 1D2, a tiny donut-shaped piece of magnetic material used in computer memories. And the example of this magnetic material is ferrite, F-E-R-R-I-T-E. It's made from ferrets. Nope, that's a joke. 1D3, a computer memory consisting of an array of cores strung on fine wires. Uh, And then broadly, the internal memory of a computer. It's called the core. And sometimes computers have multi-cores so they can be faster and stronger. Harder, better, faster, stronger. 1E, the central part of a celestial body as the Earth or Sun usually having different physical properties from the surrounding parts. We know that the Earth has a core. It's got, you know, various layers, three or four layers. uh, And then the innermost layer is the core, which I think is all iron, if I am remembering my science correctly. Um, And then, yeah, the the sun also has a core, probably also of iron, because I think once all the... Once the fusion is done, it gets to a certain point. I think iron is the biggest molecule that can be made in that process. Something like that. Um, it's a, I think it's molten core, too. It's, it's liquidy. Where were we? 1F. We're still in the ones. Um, yeah, 1F. A nodule of stone from which flakes have been struck for making implements. Um, And the example of this stone is flint or obsidian, a nodule of stone from which flakes have been struck for making implements. So they they break off pieces of this type of stone, and then but the stone that's left over is the core. One G, the conducting wire with its insulation in an electrical cable. And these are, of course, again, are all the same type of thing. They're all under number one, which is a central and often foundational part, usually distinct from the enveloping part of a difference in nature. It's just the thing in the center. It's surrounded by other stuff. 1H, an arrangement of a course of studies that combines under basic topics material from subjects conventionally separated and aims to provide a common background for all students, as in core curriculum. These are the base, the base things that people need to be learning. And uh, it was a very long and specific definition. What are those? What's the core curriculum? Math? That's a good starter point. One I, yes, we're on I, one I, the place in a nuclear reactor where fission occurs. And nuclear fission is where they're breaking apart the molecules into smaller pieces. Uh, And then in the sun, it's fusion, where they're being fused together to make bigger molecules. Uh, Yes, the nuclear core reactor. Okay, 2A, we're finally on the twos. Uh, 2A, a basic, essential, or enduring part Um, And the example of that would be an individual, a class, or an entity. A basic, essential, or enduring part as of an individual, a class, or an entity. As in, the staff had a core of experts. Also as in, the core of her beliefs. The thing at the very, the center, the basis, the... I can't think of any other words for that. To be... The essential meaning, and the synonym is gist. What's the gist of that thing? The, what's the, the, main, the main idea? As in, the core of the argument. To see, the inmost or most intimate part. The inmost or most intimate part. As in, honest to the core. All the way to their center. How many licks does it take? 
to get to the core of a Tootsie Roll Pop. Three, a part removed from the interior of a mass, especially to determine composition. And the example of the thing, the part, is uh, a thin cylinder of material. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, geologists probably do this. They they dig a, 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 a... How do they do? They have, they have a very special thing that can dig very deep and then pull out a very perfect core of something, a long, long, thin cylinder, and you can see all the different layers of soil and stones and other things. So those were all of the definitions for the first form of the word core. Um, Second form of core is a transitive verb from the 15th century. To remove a core from, as in core an apple. Maybe you can core an apple with one of those uh, one of those things. It's, it's a circle, and it's got sharp pieces in the middle, and you press it down on the apple, and it cores it. There's a space for a core, and then there's space for the pieces. If you don't feel like using a knife, you can use that thing. Core the core from the apple. Corer is a noun. The thing that is doing the coring, the person who is doing the coring. The core use the core to core to core. The corer, it uses the corer to core the core from the apple. Um, third form of core. It is a noun from 1622. It is chiefly Scottish, and it's just a group of people. Uh, let's see, this is perhaps from the Middle English. I don't know if they would say core or chore, but it's spelled chore, which means chorus or company. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's just a group of people. Um, next word is core, all caps, abbreviation for Congress of Racial Equality. What does this Congress do? It's pretty obvious. I've never heard of this Congress, but uh, hmm, interesting. That's cool. Next word. Um, it is core city. Two words, noun from 1965, and the synonym is inner city. The center, the, you know, I think inner city gets used for lots of things. Uh, next word, om, it is cord, C-O-R-E-D, adjective from 1945, having a core of a specified kind, and this is usually used in combination as in a balsa cord deck. The core of the deck is made from balsa, and balsa cord uh, is two words with a hyphen. Okay, we're on our last word. Um, it is co-religionist. C-O-R-E-L-I-G-I-O-N-I-S-T. Co-religionist. Noun from 1826, a person of the same religion. Two people, they've got the same religion, and they would be co-religionists. All right, so the words in this episode were corduroy, cordwain, cordwainer, cordwood, core, core, core city, cord, and co-religionist. Well, I think I will just have to pick core as the word of the episode, just because it's a pretty versatile word, and uh, it's, eh, you know what? Honestly, it's not all that versatile. It's kind of, it kind of just means the same thing in um, slightly different ways. It's a, it's essentially the same word, just slightly differently changed, depending on the context. Uh, what is, what is my core? What is my core? I don't know what my core is. Uh, I am made up. No, nah, nah, I don't know. I don't know. The core, the core of my personality. Why? We don't need to talk about me. Let's talk about the core of the sun is made of iron, I think. Iron is also the core of the earth, I think. All right, let's read the holidays. In the European Union, it is European 112 Day, or 112 Day, or 112, or 112. I don't know how they say it, but it's 112. Um, 
because today is February 11th, and they write that the day first, so it's 1-1 one, one for the day, and then 2. But there is no slash. Uh, Liberia has Armed Forces Day. Uh, Panay Island in the Philippines has Avelio Javier Day. Uh, do do The United States has Inventors Day. Go invent something. It's not that hard. Japan has National Foundation Day. Cameroon has Youth Day. This is one of my favorites. UN, it just says UN Women is celebrating this. Uh, I'm sure it's just the UN in general. It's International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And this is a huge thing. Um, we are finally, you know, it's been a slow, slow process, but we are finally seeing much more women in science, uh, women of color also. Uh, you know, years ago, women in general did not see a lot of scientists, other women scientists. Uh, they were very, very rare. And so um, slowly but surely, we've been seeing a lot more than that. They've been There's a lot more representation. Um, I can tell you some podcasts I listen to that are very good about being very representational of women in science. Um, ologies, I've talked about that in the past. Uh, Short Waves, that is a podcast from NPR. Uh, they are very heavily in the women science world. I'm sure there's lots and lots of other, other ones, but uh, those are the ones that I'm aware of. Uh, let's see. Italy has Lateran Treaty. Lateran Treaty, something like that. Um, let's see. Did I miss any on this page? No, I think I didn't. Uh, so Fun Holidays... Be electrific day. So it's like electric and terrific. Be electrific today. Get out your guitar day. Uh, we actually have a guitar that is in a case under the bed, never gets used. Uh, maybe we will get out the guitar. It's grandmother achievement day. So did you achieve becoming a grandmother? Is that a goal of yours? International Winter Bike to Work Day. National Don't Cry Over Spilled Milk Day. If you if you spill milk, just don't cry over it today. Just clean it up. Uh, it is National Inventors Day, like I said, and I only say that again because it uses the exact same photo as B Electrific Day, which is a, a it's just a light bulb. Uh, let's see, National Make a Friend Day. I'm sure it's not that hard. National No One Eats Alone Day. National Peppermint Patty Day. National Shut-In Visitation Day. Promise Day. Pro Sports Wives Day. There's a holiday for everything. S <laughs> sort of opposite. Stat Satisfied Staying Single Day. That's hard to say. Satisfied Staying Single Day. The Inbox Day. White Shirt Day. Oh boy, and let's check this one last page. Uh, ba -doo -ba -dee. Breeding, Reading, National Foundation Day. Foundation? Hmm. That's it. Uh, that's it. That's it. Om. Let's end the episode. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to this podcast called The Dictionary. Uh, if you could go go contact me if you want. This is a terrible start. Um, there's a Patreon. If you want to join that, you can get episodes early. Uh, you might get a few exclusive episodes. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at DictionaryPod. I post some pictures sometimes. Uh, there's an email address, DictionaryPod at gmail.com. There's a Google Voice number where you can call and leave a message. You can send me a short little song, a theme song that I would maybe put at the beginning of the episode. If you want to do your own little sound effect that I can put in an episode, you can send me an audio clip of that. And I think that's I think that's good for now. Oh, and of course, you gotta you gotta share this. You gotta let people know. Post it on your own social media. You can tag me. You can also write a review. Apple Podcasts, go do that. You know that everybody wants people, they want you to do that. So go do that. You can also listen to this on YouTube if you prefer YouTube. 
make sure to subscribe to me on YouTube. Okay, so uh, this is the last section of page 277. The first word is Coreopsis. C-O-R-E-O-P-S-I-S. Coreopsis. Noun from circa 1753. Any of a genus of widely cultivated composite herbs with showy, often yellow flower heads and pinnately lobed or dissected leaves. I think it's pinnately and not pinately, pinately, one of those. But they are pinately, pinately lobed or dissected leaves. And the genus is Coreopsis. And this is from Greek chorus, which means bed bug. Bed bug. I wonder why they chose bed bug. Um, also, it's akin to the Greek kirin, which means to cut. And that's probably because the leaves look like maybe they've been cut. There's more at the word shear. Okay, uh, the sound effect for today, I'm going to change it up a little bit. It's not so much of a sound effect, but a couple of words from a character that you might be familiar with. Hey, Bert. That was, uh, that wasn't, that wasn't great. That's fine. Um, the next word is co-repressor. So it's the word repressor with a co. Noun from 1963. A small molecule that activates a particular genetic repressor by combining with it. Hey, Bert. Next is co-requisite. Noun from circa 1948, a formal course of study required to be taken simultaneously with another. So a a required course is a requisite. Sometimes there's prerequisites, things that you have to take before something else. But a co-requisite, I don't know if I've ever had to take a co-requisite. You got to take it at the same time. So two classes would be co-requisite you got to take them at the same time for whatever reason. Depends on the situation. Hey, Bert. Next is co-respondent. Noun from 1857. A person named as guilty of adultery with the defendant in a divorce suit. Uh, A person named as guilty of adultery with the defendant in a divorce. So people are getting divorced one of them is being is the defendant and then they they were guilty i'm not sure it's something something about that co-respondent uh okay next word hey bert now oh, we changed it up a little bit i see uh so this word is corf c o r f yes corf noun from 1653 it is british and it means a basket tub or truck used in a mine like a mine where they go they go take coal out or whatever it is a basket a tub or a truck used at that mine is called a corf why is it called a corf i'm not sure Uh, it says it's a middle english word that means basket from middle dutch also corf or middle lower german corf with a k from latin Corbis, C-O-R-B-I-S, and that means basket. So somehow it went from Corbis to Corf. It's just a basket or a tub or a truck. Next word, it's a, this is a fun one. Hey, Bert. It's Corgi, noun from 1926, uh, and it's just the synonym Welsh Corgi. Um, what, what is this word? Where does this word come from? Uh, so it comes, oh, this is so interesting. It uh, it comes from the Welsh word, or maybe it is a Welsh word, and it comes from two parts. The first part is, it must be, th- these are both Welsh words, I think, cor, C-O-R, and that means dwarf. And then the second part is not gi, G-I, it's actually C-I, so somehow it changed, but maybe it's pronounced gi, I don't know Welsh. It's a very complicated language. Uh, but that word, C-I, means dog. So it means dwarf dog. 
Corgi literally means dwarf dog, because that is what they are. And they come from Wales. That's, that's where Welsh is spoken. I will never look at a corgi the same way again. Obviously, we have to post a picture of a corgi, some of the cutest little dogs out there. Hey, Bert. Next word is coriaceous. C-O-R-I-A-C-E-O-U-S. Coriaceous. Adjective from 1674, and it just means resembling leather, as in coriaceous foliage. Um, doesn't really give a whole lot of information of why this word is this word and why it means resembling leather. Um, it says it's from Lower Latin coriaceous, however they would pronounce it, uh, and there's more at the word Q, how do you say this word? C U I R A S S. Curious? Curious? I'm not sure. We'll learn more about that later. Coriaceous is resembling leather. Next word, Hebert. It is coriander. Coriander, uh, you can emphasize the first syllable, coriander, or you can emphasize the third syllable, Coriander. Coriander? Who says that? This is a noun from the 14th century. One, an old world annual herb of the carrot family with aromatic fruits. And the scientific name is Coriandrum sativum. Coriandrum sativum. Number two, the ripened dry fruit of coriander used as a flavoring. And this is called also coriander seed. This is from eh, the etymology. Not much to it. Next word. Hebert. Corinthian. Capital C. First form. Noun from 1520. One. A native or resident of Corinth, Greece. Corinth, Greece. They are Corinthians. Number two. A merry profligate man. Mary, M-E-R-R-Y, profligate, or profligate, P-R-O-F-L-I-G-A-T-E. A A merry profligate man is a Corinthian. Next word, rubber ducky. It is the second form of Corinthian, adjective from 1594, one of relating to or characteristic of Corinth or Corinthians. Two, of or relating to the lightest and most ornate of the three ancient Greek architectural orders, distinguished especially by its large capitals, decorated with carved acanthus leaves. And then it says to see the order illustration. Yeah, O-R-D-E-R. There's a whole illustration for orders of things. Next word. Hebert, Corinthians, so we added an S, it still has the capital C. It is a noun from 1520, either of two letters written by St. Paul to the Christians of Corinth and included as books in the New Testament. And then it says to see the Bible table, which we already read. Hebert, next word is Coriolis effect. Two words. The first word is capital C O R I O L I S, and then the second word effect. It's uh, it starts with an E. Noun from circa 1946. The apparent deflection of a moving object that is the result of the Coriolis force. The apparent deflection of a moving object. Uh, we will learn about Coriolis of force next. I'm just trying to gather this in my brain. So something bounces off of something else. And that's the Coriolis effect. I guess. Next word. Hey, Bert. Coriolis force. Noun from 1923. An apparent force that, as a result of the Earth's rotation, deflects moving objects to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. 
And uh, let's see. So the examples of these things that would be deflecting would be projectiles or air currents. This is named after Gaspard G. Coriolis, who was a French civil engineer and died in 1843. And I can give you more information on this because I knew I've heard of it before, but I couldn't remember. Uh, okay, so I learned that I learned this in a, in a science class in college. It's pretty fascinating because you wouldn't necessarily think of this. Okay, if you were to stand at the North Pole and shoot, and I, th- I hope I get this right, and you were to shoot a projectile straight south towards the equator from any, any point up there, uh, or just anywhere from the north. If you shoot something going down, um, but again, this also has to do with uh, air currents, wind, uh, water, anything that's moving. Um, if it's going south towards the equator, because of the Earth's rotation, because the Earth is rotating towards the east, that thing will move or seem to move to the right if you're going down south it will seem to move towards the right if you're looking at the earth from space uh, it would be moving towards the west because as the earth moves to the right the thing keeps on going in what it thinks is a straight line but it moves to the west it's kind of hard to describe verbally you'd have to see it maybe i'll post a picture so you can see it better then it's the opposite if you're going if you if something's going north towards the equator from the southern hemisphere as the earth moves to the right towards the east this thing the projectile the air whatever it is it seems to move to the west or it does you know if the earth weren't rotating it would move in a straight line but as the earth moves away from this thing it moves to the west to the left in that case is this making sense it's amazing because if you start if you know it and then you look at air and wind and water currents and stuff, it all is following this Coriolis force, this effect that happens because of the Coriolis force. Uh, it's it's pretty fascinating, and it is literally affecting everything on the Earth at all times, constantly. We are living in a world, and all worlds that are spinning are dealing, this thing is happening constantly. Uh, yeah, so so that that's that. That's that. Okay, next word. Hey, Bert. It is corium, C-O-R-I-U-M, noun from 1836, and the synonym is dermis, and I think that's just skin. Uh, And then this is uh, corium is a Latin word, which means leather. And there's more at the word. uh, This is the second time we've seen it. C-U-I-R-A-S-S. Kuiras, kuiras. I don't know how to say it, but yes, leather is made from skin, and dermis is skin, so that all makes sense. Next word, Haber. It is cork. First form, C O R K, noun from the 14th century, 1A. The elastic, tough outer layer, no, outer tissue of the cork oak that is used especially for stoppers and insulation. Uh, Yeah, it's a pretty fascinating material that is organic. It comes from a tree, and then we use it in things. It's this organic material that is kind of, yeah, it's tough, but it's elastic. It's very cool. I've never uh, never experienced it in, in nature, in the world, on a tree. Uh, I feel like we're running out, though, aren't we? I know a lot of winemakers are using uh, other materials instead of cork, so that's good. And they're just as good. It's not like it's affecting the wine. It's fine. Uh, 1B, the synonym is phelum, P-H-E-L-L-E-M, phelum. 2, a usually cork stopper for a bottle or jug. 3, A fishing float. Yeah, cork would definitely float in the water. Okay, where is this from? There's a lot of etymology here. Uh, It is a Middle English word, which means cork or bark. From Middle Dutch, kurk with a K, 
or Middle Lower German Cork, K-O-R-C-K, from Old Spanish Alcorque, uh, which is from Arabic Kurk, spelled Q-U-R-Q, from Latin Quercus, which means oak, and there's more at the word fir, F-I-R, like a fir tree, but it comes from an oak tree. How did the firs get into this situation? Okay, next word, Hebert. That's, uh, by the way, if you don't know, that's Ernie saying, hey, Bert. Hey, Bert. Second form of cork is a transitive verb from 1535. One, to furnish or fit with cork or a cork. With cork or a cork. Cork the bottle with a cork. Two, to stop up with a cork, as in cork a bottle. Three, to blacken with burnt cork. Uh, oh, as in the example, corked faces. So would people, if they wanted to darken their face, I'm, I assume this must have been used for blackface many, many years ago. Would they? Did they use a, a, a burnt cork to do that? Um, I know that when we were kids, you like um, I, I remember doing this when I was real little, uh, my, if you, uh, like Charlie Chaplin, if we wanted to dress up like Charlie Chaplin and put that little Charlie Chaplin mustache, which is not a great mustache to be putting on anybody, uh, you'd burn the end of a cork. So it was kind of this ashy and you could just, you know, draw a little, a little mustache on your face. Um, I did not know people would color their whole face that way. That's, that's, way too much and bad just bad um and uh, oh i i think another um uh groucho marx that was another mustache that you could put on your face with a burnt cork uh when i was a kid in our back by the back door we had a, a whole wall or a good portion of a wall was just a big cork board so we would you know put calendars up there and pictures and stuff and then uh, I think we, when we took it down, all the cork was falling off or something. And I think I remember getting a piece of the cork in my eye. I was probably like four years old or something. Uh, and every time I think of cork, I can't not think about the movie Dirty Rotten Scoundrels with uh, Steve Martin and, oh my God, Michael Caine. And uh, there's that great scene where he says to Steve Martin, Oh, no, somebody else says, why is the cork on the fork? Oh, the cork is on the fork to prevent him from hurting himself. And then he smacks himself in the eye with the cork on the fork. Okay, we have one more word. Hey, Bert, it is corkage. C-O-R-K-A-G-E, noun from 1838. A charge for opening a bottle of wine bought elsewhere. So if you buy your wine from somewhere else and then you take it to a restaurant that is BYOB, they will charge you a corkage fee. They may charge you a corkage fee, but it's also much cheaper than buying the bottle of wine or whatever it is at their restaurant because they always charge way too much because it's a business. They got to make money somehow. All right. So the words of this, the words today in this episode were Coreopsis, co-repressor, co-requisite, co-respondent, corf, corgi, coriaceous, coriander, Corinthian, Corinthians, Coriolis effect, Coriolis force, corium, cork, and corkage. Well, I had a lot to say about cork, but I think I'm going to pick Coriolis force because, because... Uh, let's see. Any, any planet in the universe that is spinning has the Coriolis effect happening to it. This is a terrible song with terrible words. The Coriolis force is happening when a planet is rotating. Everything seems to spin in the other direction. All right. I am, I am feeling bad about all this. Okay. Let's talk about the holidays. It is Darwin Day, and I very coincidentally happen to be wearing my Darwin shirt 
uh, it's like a portrait of Darwin, and he's hugging a chimp, and it's it's odd. It's uh, you know, it's not like the most accurate thing, but it's more about the sentiment of science that I like about it. Uh, Georgia, the U.S. state Georgia, is celebrating Georgia Day. It's also Lincoln's birthday. The U.N. has Red Hand Day. Myanmar has Union Day. Venezuela has Youth Day. Um, all right, I think we're all ready to the fun holidays. It is Global Movie Day. So go watch a movie from another part of the globe, uh, and it shows a picture of the Chicago Theater. It's Hug Day. Just, just hug somebody all day long. It is the NAACP Day. That's that's a good one. Maybe they were started on February 12th. It is National Freedom to Marry Day. That means you are free to marry whoever you want to marry. That's a relatively new concept in this country. Glad we finally got there, mostly. It's National Lost Penny Day. National Plum Pudding Day. Oglethorpe Day. Oh, that's also known, known as Georgia Day. Paul Bunyan Day. Safety Pup Day. Anything else on this page? Nope, that's it. Okay, that is it. We finished page 277, and up next is 278. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Spencer dispensing information. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to the dictionary yet again. Uh, This is the podcast by me, Spencer, where I read the dictionary, and I tell you what I think about the things that I read. Do you need to know any more than that? Probably not. Okay, the first word in this episode on the top of page 278 is corkboard. One word, cork and board. Noun from circa 1893, a heat-insulating material made of compressed granulated cork. Also, a bulletin board made with this material. It's not a maririal. Heat insulating material. So what does that mean? Heat insulating is if you so if you put cork around a thing, it it is insulated from the heat of the cork or the cork is he keeps all the heat inside. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example of something that is insulated by cork, but I can't think of anything. I don't know. Do they make double layered mugs with cork in the middle to keep keep it insulated? Probably not. Uh, that, yeah, I had no idea about that part of it, but I knew that you can make a bulletin board out of cork, and then you stick the pins in there. Uh, okay, next word, uh, my sound effect, I'm, I'm gonna do like a, like a vocal warm-up sound effect. Um, that's a good one. The, so the next one is cork camb, cambium, cambium. Cork is the first word, second word is C-A-M-B-I-U-M, cambium. Noun from 1878, the synonym is phelogen, P-H-E-L-L-O-G-E-N, phelogen, whatever that is. Next word, it is corked with an E-D at the end, adjective from 1828, and the synonym is the number two definition for the word corky with a Y, which we will see soon in this very episode. Corker is next with an ER noun from 1881. One. One that corks containers, and the examples of those containers might be bottles. And I just thought it was funny that I said the number one three times in a row, 1881, number one, one that corks. I just, I just like fun things like that. I don't know why. Uh, number two, for corker, one that is excellent or remarkable. Why, why does this mean this? Why does corker mean one that is excellent or, or remarkable? What's the etymology of that one? It doesn't tell me. Um, hmm. I'm curious about that. I don't know. Uh, let's see. If we go back to cork, uh, 
I'm seeing things. Blackened with burnt coal, stop up with the cork. Yeah, I'm not really seeing anything that's uh, that's making that make any sense. Oh well, we have to just move on with life. That was a bad one. Next word is corking with an ing, adjective or adverb from 1895, and it means extremely fine. And this is often used as an intensive, especially before the word good, as in, had a corking good time. <laughs> this, is, this is a good one. I don't know why I like it so much. It's just a funny word. And how often does this actually get used? Do people say this? Did, they must have said this back in the 1895 times, but I don't think, I don't know, maybe there's somebody who still says this. Uh, and then this is uh, similar to that number two for corker. I don't understand why, where this came from. It's probably just some random person started using it in those words, in those ways, in that context, and then it stuck. How do you do that? Next word. It is cork oak. Two words. And actually, uh, if we go back to the word cork, um, it is... It is a cork oak. It's the elastic, tough, t- tough outer tissue of the cork oak tree, uh, and it is from uh, the Latin quercus, which means oak. So it's the this is gonna be the tree that the cork comes from, right? Noun from 1873. I don't know why I had to go through all of that just now. So this is an oak of southern Europe and northern Africa that is the source of the cork of commerce. The cork of commerce. The scientific name is Quercus suber. And then, yeah, Quercus, we learned that that's the Latin word for oak. Uh, But suber, S-U-B-E-R, not sure where that one comes from. Next word, it is corkscrew. One word, my lips are going to be so warmed up by the end of this episode. So this is the first form of corkscrew, noun from 1698, a device for drawing corks from bottles that has a pointed spiral piece of metal turned by a handle. It is a screw that goes into a cork, so it is a corkscrew. Uh, This this is a whole world, corkscrews. I have so many thoughts of things that I could say about corkscrews. Have you ever seen the ones where, you know, the part the part that sits on the lip of the bottle, uh, it has a little notch cut out. There are ones that have like a dual. It's like hinged. So you, you can press down the first part on the bottle and get like the first pull of the cork and it might go halfway. And then there's a second part to that thing. I don't know what that metal part is called. There's a second part. So you can get another good a good grip on it. The, the lever physics action motion happening um man for some reason i have bought some corkscrews in the past that are like sort of decorative uh and and they don't they don't work so good they either break right away or i don't know it's very odd so just get something non-decorative ugly and gross and it's gonna work great for decades probably we have one of those electric ones but then you gotta power it up and it's it's fine I've heard that the, uh, what is it, the the rabbit, is that the one that is really good because it sort of looks like rabbit ears? That's supposed to be a really, really fancy, expensive one that works great. I don't think I'll ever get one of those. You can you can open up a corkscrew. You can get the cork out of the bottle with a, with a shoe. If you, like, do something with it, you, like, take off the, the plastic on the top and then you put it in a shoe with, like, a thick rubber sole and you can hit the shoe and then the cork starts to pop up there's videos on youtube maybe i'll put that in there it's like it's a cork it's a corkscrew with no screw it's a corkless no it's a screwless corkscrew maybe that's an invention how do you do that i don't know um and if if you are gonna go uh go have a little little um snacks and stuff in the park uh have a little picnic which is the word that we've been using although i've heard it's racist so you know use it with caution i don't want to use a word that's racist but that's the only word we have for it uh anyway if you go take a take some wine 
uh, on a picnic, you be, me, need to make sure that you either get a screw top so it's easy to open or don't forget your corkscrew. How many times have we been in this situation where we forget our corkscrew and we don't have a way to open up our wine? You got to bring one. You got to have one in the car. You got to have one in your purse at all times if you're a wine drinker or or get a screw top. Okay, next word. Brrr. Second form of corkscrew adjective from 1790 resembling a corkscrew. And the synonym is spiral. Brrr. Third form of corkscrew is a verb from 1837. One it is the synonym wind. I think it would be wind and not wind because it's an action. You're winding it like a corkscrew. Two, to draw out with difficulty. Three, to twist into a spiral. Uh, those were transitive. I, f I forgot to say that, I think. Now we have intransitive. To move in a winding course corkscrew around you see those signs on the street uh that this you know maybe it's in in ireland and it's very uh rural and hilly and the the roads just go around and they corkscrew around and the signs there was that great sign in peewee's big adventure it was a crazy not even a corkscrew it was something crazier than that okay next word it is cork wood one word Noun from 1756, any of several trees having light or corky wood, especially a small or shrubby tree of the southeastern U.S. that has extremely light, soft wood. And the scientific name of this shrubby tree is Leitneria floridana. Leitneria floridana. Um, and I think... That is it for that one. Uh, going back to the cork oak, I don't know if I've ever seen what these look like, so maybe I need to post a picture of the cork oak. Um, it would be great if if the if the tree just looked like a very large cork that you put in a bottle. Okay, next word. It is corky with a Y. Adjective from 1756. One resembling cork. Two, having an unpleasant odor and taste. Uh, and uh, that odor or taste could be from a tainted cork. So yeah, if you have wine, that's the easiest example, although I'm sure there's other things too. If it tastes like cork, if the cork has tainted the liquid, the wine, then you can call it corky because it tastes like cork. As in corky wine. There's the example. Corkiness is a noun. Uh, I went to high school with somebody whose nickname was Corky, and I think it would have been great to have him on this show. Um, but I, I didn't, I didn't look ahead, and I didn't plan. That would be funny. Um, does does he resemble Cork in any way? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think anybody would want to resemble Cork. No, we don't want that. Next word. I can't, I don't know what else to do with this sound effect. Next word is corm, C-O-R-M, noun from 1830. It is a rounded, a rounded, thick, modified, underground, stem base bearing membranous or scaly leaves. Now, wait, I think I screwed this up. A rounded, thick, modified, underground stem stem base, I think that's supposed to be one thing, a stem base, bearing membranous or scaly leaves and buds and acting as a vegetative reproductive structure. And it says to compare to the synonyms, I assume they would be synonyms, bulb and tuber. Uh, okay, maybe the etymology is going to help. It is from the Greek kormos with a K, which means tree trunk, uh, from kirin, which means to cut, and there's more at the word shear. So, a rounded, thick, there's so many adjectives, a rounded, thick, modified, underground stem base. So, it's the beginning of a thing that grows. 
That's what a bulb is, a tuber. It's a thing that something grows from. And it bears, and it produces membranous or scaly leaves and buds. And it is a vegetative reproductive structure. Hmm. I'm sure there are so many people who are who deal with corm all the time. Corms, these things, I have no clue what they are. Next word. Uh, it is cormel or cormel. C-O-R-M-E-L. Cormel, cormel. Noun from circa 1900. A small or secondary corm produced by a larger corm. So a corm can be grown from a corm. Fascinating. Next word. I don't know. Co- okay, so this one you can pronounce it either cormorant, cormorant, or cormorant, or cormorant. Cormorant, cormorant, cormorant. Some of you might not have heard any difference. It is C O R M O R A N T. Noun from the 14th century. One, any of various dark colored web footed water birds that have a long neck, hooked bill, and distensible throat pouch. At first, I thought that said throat punch, and that is something completely different. Um, and then number two is a gluttonous. No, no, no. I forgot to say that the uh, the family name for these dark colored web footed water birds is Phallicrocoracidae. Phallicrocus. Phallicrocoracidae. I think that's pretty close. And then the genus name is Phallicrocorax. Phallicrocorax. Um, they, so it's it's describing what they look like. And that they have a throat pouch like a, what is that bird that has the big throat pouch? Um, a pelican? Yes, I think it's the pelican. So they're kind of like pelicans, I think. Uh, and then number two is a gluttonous, greedy, or rapacious person is a cormorant. And uh, I, I have a feeling that, I don't know if these birds necessarily are gluttonous, greedy, or rapacious. They might be. But I think just the fact that they have this distensible throat pouch sort of gives the idea that you know they can fill up a lot of stuff in there and it maybe gives the idea the feeling that they're greedy or gluttonous that maybe seems like they're eating a lot maybe they do eat a lot so that's why you can also call a person like a cormorant um etymology let's see okay it is from uh old french cormorang which is from corp, C-O-R-P. That must be still Fre- old French. Corp means raven. And of course, we uh, we saw some of those raven and cor words, cor, uh, cr- raven and crow words in the C-O-R-Ds. And uh, so that means raven and meren, merenk. Merenk means of the sea. So it's like raven of the sea. Um, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. There's more at the word corbel and marine. So that's what a cormorant is. It's the raven of the sea. (laughs) Next word, we have three forms. It is our last word. It is the word corn, C-O-R-N. First form is pretty long. It's a noun from before the 12th century. Number one is chiefly a dialect. It is a small, hard particle, and the synonym is grain. So it, you just call a small, hard particle uh, corn. Doesn't matter what it is, maybe it's just corn. Just call it corn. But that's a dialect in certain areas. Number two, a small, hard seed, and this is usually used in combination, as in peppercorn or barley corn. So it doesn't mean that it's corn on the cob like we think of. It just uh, it's just a little a little hard seed. Three is British, the grain of a cereal grass that is the primary crop of a region. And uh, the example would be as wheat in Britain and oats in Scotland and Ireland. 
so the grain of a cereal grass that is a primary crop. So I guess you would call wheat in Britain corn, and you would call oats in Scotland and Ireland also corn. That's interesting. Interesting. We have an also, also a plant that produces corn. Yes, of course, that would be corn. For a a tall annual cereal grass, originally domesticated in Mexico and widely grown for its large, elongated ears of starchy seeds. And this is called also Indian corn, also called maize, M-A-I-Z-E. And the scientific name for this, it's technically a cereal grass. Did you know that corn is a, or this, at least this type of corn, is a cereal grass? Um, it is, the scientific name is Zea mace. Okay, so, okay, so Zea, Z-E-A, I don't know if it's Zea or Zia. Uh, the second word is not maize, M-A-I-Z-E, it is M-A-Y-S. I assume it's pronounced mace or maize, but that's, it's spelled differently. So there must, there must be some etymological thing going on there. There, there's clearly a connection. It can't be a coincidence, I don't think. Okay, for B, the typically yellow or whitish seeds of corn used especially as food for humans and livestock. And it gets put in everything. For C, an ear of corn with or without its leafy outer covering. I have not, what do they call it when you take the leaves off? Oh my God! It's been so many years. I haven't I haven't made corn since I don't know when. You, there's a pro, there's a name for the taking off of the leaves and all the stringy stuff. And when when you're a kid, your parents will make you do that. And uh, I don't know. It's kind of fun. It's fine. But I don't live in a place we don't we don't make corn. We we can't. We don't have a grill. We don't grill it. We could boil it up. Sometimes when we go to my parents' house, we'll have corn. But uh, it's a pretty rare pretty rare thing. I feel like for me. Why am I telling you these things about my life? I have no idea. They just come out. Number five for corn is the synonym corn whiskey. I think that's whiskey made from corn. 6A, something, something, what something? Something as writing, music, or acting that is corny. So you just call it corn. I have never done this. I just say it's corny. I don't call it corn now, is there a connection between that corny, something being corny, that word, and popcorn? Um, let's see. When are we going to see corny? It's uh, one, two, three, four, four episodes from now. Um, yeah, I wonder. I'm not going to look ahead. I won't do it. I just won't do it. You can't make me. I, I almost did. I almost did, but I'm not going to look ahead at the etymology for corny. I wonder if there's a popcorn. See, the thing is, though, other things can be corny. I don't think it has to do only with movies. I'm very curious, though. Okay, we are on uh, 6, 6B, the quality or state of being corny, and the synonym is corniness. 7, the synonym is corn snow. What is corn snow? Okay, the etymology for corn it is from the Old Norse corn with a K, which means grain, and that's it. Second form of corn. Brrr. It is a verb only transitive from 1560. One, to form into grains, and the synonym is granulate. 2A, to, pre- to preserve or season with salt in grains. 2B, to cure or preserve in brine containing preservatives and often seasonings, as in corned beef. So why do they call it corned beef? So to, so let's see. The first one was to form into grains. The second one is preserve or season with salt in grains. So is it, it, we're, they're just using the grains, uh, the word corn for grains as an all-encompassing term, like they did with the wheat in Britain. It seems like it's just a, it's just one of those words like, Hoover or Kleenex that people just use, Coke, they just use it for all the things. Um, 
But so I'm, I, the reason I went over that was because to be to cure or preserve in brine containing preservatives and often seasonings. Uh, I, I'm still not sure why they say corned. Why is it corned? Is there corn involved? Are there other grains involved? I'm not sure. Number three, to feed with corn. It's just to feed with corn. And finally, that was the biggest, longest lip warm-up I could think of. This is the third form of corn, noun from the 15th century, a local hardening and thickening of epidermis, <laughs> as on a toe. I don't think I have any corns on my feet. Not yet, oh, not yet. Anyway, maybe when I get older, I will get some corns. Uh, let's see, it is from Anglo-French. It means horn, from the Latin cornu, which means horn or point, and there's more at the word horn. So, uh, yeah. It's it just it became it was horn and then it became corn, so it's just a it's a horn on the foot. Not literally though. It's it's something different. Uh, okay, I think now is a good time to reread the words. I have talked a lot. My episodes keep on getting longer and longer. I'm so sorry about that. So we had cork board, cork cambium, corked, corker, corking, cork oak, corkscrew, cork wood. Corky, Corm, Cormel, Cormorant, and Corn. Um, let's see. This is this is difficult. I think I should put a picture of a few of these up on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Um, which one do I like? I don't know. This is hard. I I'm kind of thinking corkscrew. It's uh it's a pretty good tool to keep around. You can use it for things. Uh, yeah, let's pick corkscrew as the word of the episode. I'm going round. I'm going round. I'm a corkscrew. Spin me round so I can open your wine. Corkscrew, corkscrew. I'm a corkscrew. Uh, okay, holidays in Myanmar. It is Children's Day. It is World Radio Day. It is National Cheddar Day, International Condom Day. Wear your darn condoms. It is Galentine's Day, because tomorrow is Valentine's Day. It is Internet Friends Day. Maybe you can meet your internet friends in the real life. It's the Super Bowl. Happy Super Bowl. In Norway, it is Mother's Day. In Chile, it is National Press Day. What does this page have to di- have to say to me? It is Autism Sunday. Uh, this is also known as International Day of Prayer for Autism. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, um, it is also. Uh, oh, actually, I didn't finish the name. It is International Prayer Day of Prayer for Autism and Asperger Syndrome. I've got I've got my own feelings about that that name, but I think it's also just good to. Be aware of autism and be respectful of people who are on that spectrum. And uh, I, I think there's another day, though, that's probably World Autism Day. So this one's seems more specific about prayer. It is also Dream Your Sweet Day. Huh? Dream Your Sweet Day. Employee Legal Awareness Day. Get a Different Name Day. Should I get a different name? International Natural Day. Natural. It is Kiss Day. You can kiss people, but only if they give you permission. Madly in Love With Me Day. Madly in Love With Me Day. Man Day. (laughs) Man Day? Do we need a man day? Is it a... It's not even on a Monday. It's observed the Sunday before February 14th. So it's going to be on different days. Why isn't Man Day on a Monday? It is National Break Up With Your Carrier Day. That would be your phone carrier. Oh my God, why are there so many holidays? National Crab Rangoon Day. 
and it shows a picture of a crab before it has been turned into Crab Rangoon. It, it doesn't like being turned into Crab Rangoon. It's National Tortellini Day. World Marriage Day. I had no clue that today had so many holidays. You can kiss on your marriage, eat some cheddar and tortellini and crab rangoon and kiss. I said that and and be a man. Hey. Okay, one more page to check just to see if we missed anything else. Nope, that's it. Okay, thank you. This has been Spencer Dispensing Information. Goodbye.